Good evening. Welcome back to Orthodox Ethos and the Orthodox Ethos podcast. Tonight we're going to be talking about the new book or the reissue of the uh, publication of, Orth- of Uncle Mountain Press, Exmo Guitar, a manual of confession by St. Nicodemus of the Hagurite. And we're going to be presenting the contents and discussing the book and also how uh, the layman can read it and benefit from it. So we're looking forward to discussing with you. Thanks for joining us. And we'll be right back right after our intro. <laughs> Well, this book is a classic in Orthodox spiritual life. It's been, of course, written by our father, our Venerable and God-bearing father, St. Nicodemus, more than 250 years ago, about 240 years ago. And it was produced out of a great love for the people of God, and especially the pastors, but also those who are seeking to be healed in the sacrament of confession, how to approach, how to repent, how to stand before God, and all of the boundaries laid down by the Holy Fathers in the gospel uh, to which we have to be attentive to and live within so that we are in the will of God and therefore open to the grace of God. We live in a time period where, unfortunately, especially in the Western world, but also in the Orthodox lands, we've seen a great if not disdain, distance, and indifference to the holy canons laid down by the Holy Fathers in the ecumenical councils. A misunderstanding oftentimes of what they they mean, their role in our life, and how they can guide us on the narrow path of salvation. We'll talk about the canons that are presented in the Ex Mulligatarium from St. John the Faster, but also the proper understanding of the canons and their application in the church today. We'll talk about uh the great and inspiring words of saint nicodemus to the penitent which is a big part of what is directed toward the layman and why this book is so such a good book and such an important book for the layman we've got we've got some visitors tonight uh and so let's let's first of all just introduce the book talk about the contents talk about who has uh, uh participated in the in the publication how it came to be and first of all, let's put a uh, on the screen just the uh, title of the book, or the uh, cover of the book, rather. Uh, this is the new version that we just produced at Uncle Mountain Press, uh, Exum Logitari, Man of Confession. This is an updated and improved version uh, from the older version. I think it's very, been done very well by our graphic designer, George Weiss. We're very grateful to him and his very talented work. And so... Uh, that's what you're going to be looking for when you're going to buy it or if you want to find it online. This is the book we're talking about. It's available through Amazon and the Uncle Mountain Press website. So let me also share that with you so you're aware. Uh, first of all, on the Uncut Mountain Press website, we have, let's see, we'll go that that way. Uh, if you go to Uncle Mountain Press, you'll see this, and this is going to show you all the con- the uh, the uh, basic info uh, of the book, uh, the overview, the notes, the details, uh, how much uh, the various versions cost: soft cover, hard cover, digital version, and if you're a wholesaler, a bookstore, the uh, discounts if you have that uh, on your screen. Uh, there are videos to watch, a preview uh, of the text, and a, wa- a video you can find online which introduces the book as well. So there's plenty of material there uh, to learn more about the book. We'll talk about some of that tonight. Also, you can have, you can acquire the book on Amazon. And let me also share that screen with you. Um, all three versions are available on Amazon. And let's see, does, it does not show, is it showing all three versions? No, that's kind of curious. Hmm. Oh, this is probably because 
of my particular version. No, that's not it either. I don't know. There it is. Hardcover. Well, it was there for a second. Strange. Oh, that's what is going on. There we go. Hardcover, Kindle, paperback. I think the Kindle's because I have Kindle Unlimited. That's probably why it's offered zero. So there you go. You know how to find it on Amazon. And then let's go to, uh, I want to share with you um, some of the words of those who wrote the preface and also the introduction to the book. Let's start with there. Let's let's look at the table of contents for a minute, and then we'll break back to um, that um, uh, some excerpts that we have from. Let's see. There we go. So, before we get, let me go back to the, the first pages of the book of the of the text, and you can see a little bit about how uh, the book is in, introduced. So. This is the Greek version uh, from the publication uh, in the ninth, in the 18th century. Uh, after the uh, introduction for the works of St. Nicodemus, if you're not familiar with the works and what we've done at Uncle Mountain Press, there's three volumes so far to the works of St. Nicodemus, all translated by Father George Dokos, who is a tremendous uh, asset to the church and a translator, first-rate translator, did his PhD thesis you can find his book on St. Nicodemus through New Rome Press. Uh, he translated all three of these uh, back in the day when he was in Greece with us. Ex Guitar and a Man of Confession Concerning Frequent Communion, which was coming out and it will be showcased by Uncompton Press in about 10 days, two weeks. And Confession of Faith, which was his own confession and defense uh, against those in his day who were innovating and attacking the patristic tech, uh, practice of frequent communion or uh, memorial services only on Saturday and other issues that were facing the church at the time. So this uh, this is a very valuable book, a lot of unknown book. We're going to be coming out of the new version, new expanded version in a few weeks. So this is the Ex Mulligatarian, a manual of confession. Ex Mulligatarian is the term in Greek that we've maintained, we've kept in the Greek and the English version, which basically means a manual of confession. Uh, and so we have that as a subtitle. And it says, and this is copying the Greek, a book most profitable to the soul containing concise instruction to the spiritual father on how to conduct a fruitful confession. The canons of St. John the Faster, we'll talk about that in a minute, meticulously interpreted, pleasing counsel for the penitent on how to confess as one should, and a homily on repentance profitable to the soul. So it has a little bit of everything for everyone who is involved in the confession in the sacrament, the mystery of confession. And it's gathered, as it says, from various teachers and good and put into good order. Uh, so this is the second version. And uh, uh, we have there in the beginning, we could, if we confess our sins from 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So basic, basic cornerstone of our life in Christ is repentance coupled with confession before God, before the church, before the priest, and the and the prayers of the church through the priest for the remission of sins and the uh, the, the return to communion, which is the, of course, salvation in Christ. Uh, the Politician here, uh, which is a beautiful, beautiful uh, Politician for St. Nicodemus, the Synodical Act uh, in, um, I think it was, let's see, 1955? Yes, 1955 uh, in... Uh, uh, the 31st of May, when they enrolled him into the uh, list of saints in the, by the, in the Ecumenical Patriarchate. And that's really interesting because, of course, he reposed in, I think it was 18, I want to say 18, 10, 12, something, somewhere around there. And so over 140 years or so passed uh, before his recognition of uh, sanctity. Now, here are the table of contents, and we begin with the preface introduction, and uh, I want to share with you an excerpt from the preface and introduction. Uh, first of all, we have a preface from His Grace Bishop Basil, uh, which is uh, tremendous, but we're only going to share a, a little excerpt here. Uh, and Bishop Basil uh, is enthusiastically uh, welcoming the publication back in what was it, 2008 when it initially came out and embracing uh, the work that we do at Orthodox Ethos and Mountain Press and the work by Father George Dokus. Uh, but his, his introduction is really, um, his preface rather, is really um, quite 
helpful and good in the sense that it points to um, St. Nicodemus' place at the time in the church. I want to I want to quote from uh, the life of St. Nicodemus, which he begins his preface with, and that is, Almost all that were wounded by sin left hierarchs and confessors and ran to shabbily dressed Nicodemus in order to find their cure and consolation from their afflictions. Not only monks from monasteries, skeets and kelia on Manathos, but also many Christians from various places. And this is the characteristic, brothers and sisters, that's how Bishop Basil opens up his preface. This is characteristic of, in fact, the throughout church history, really, the role of the spiritual father, the guy, the monastic, oftentimes the monastic, although not always, sometimes they're very notable and holy priests who, who become great uh, uh, priests in the world, who become great uh, centers of spiritual re regeneration. Uh, but oftentimes it's been uh, from the Holy Mountain in the last millennium, especially where these great spiritual fathers come off, having been now totally cleansed, totally illumined, uh, through the very strict life of asceticism in, in stillness. And they bring that which God has given them for the sake of their brothers and sisters. And really much of the period during the Turkish period, which the, the Ottoman period, which is uh, St. Nicodemus is at the tail end of that, uh, is, care, is, 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 is let's say the, the, the day is saved by these great confessors of faith. People like St. Cosmas at the Los, who on the new calendar, we just celebrated his uh, memory. Uh, and there are many such figures in the four or 500 year uh, period after the fall of Constantinople until the 20th century. Uh, and these figures were instrumental. And St. Nicodemus was one of many. Um, and there's others who are, many others who are recognized but never glorified. We don't know much about them. For instance, I think now about to be or or maybe even already glorified is Papulachis, a very famous uh, monk who has uh, spent m much of his last part of his life circling uh, the um, Peloponnesus and other parts of Greece, confessing and teaching the people a, a lot like St. Cosmas did. So lest we forget in our day in the Western world where the monasticism is basically 20, 30, 40 years old in a, for a lot of people with, a, with the coming of many of the monasteries of Manathos, of course it goes back until the 40s with or the 40s with the uh, founding or or even earlier with the founding of, of Holy Trinity Monastery and other monasteries. But for many Orthodox Christians, monastic life is still a, a foreign and unknown reality uh, because they grew up in a very secular society, maybe in places in other places of the world like South Africa or parts of Europe or parts of Australia, there really is no functional way for many of the faithful to reach the monasteries. And the monasteries are new and they don't have these towering figures of ascetic life who can uh, play the role of the great spiritual father. So so we, uh, in our day and age, we are somewhat faced with a distortion of the image of life in the Orthodox Church. What is the normal life of the Orthodox Church? And there is even an anti, of course, a very anti monastic segment of orthodox christians in america and other places where they they have never they've they've been let's say led astray in how to understand the monasteries the role of the monastic life mount athos you hear very unsettling and unfortunate comments about mount athos from certain circles in the church disdaining it or disregarding it or 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 downplaying it and only one who's grossly ignorant of the church's history for the last thousand years can really stand and say such things. And that's why our press and Come Out and Press is so dedicated to bringing the monastic ascetic witness of Mount Athos to bear in the church in America, and especially St. Nicodemus, this towering figure who produced so much, so much literature for uh, the Orthodox Christians of the day. Just unbelievable, uh, prolific, uh, turning out, patristic text after patristic text, uh, and, and these being circulated. And really, uh, along with St. Paisus Velichkovsky being the one of the sources of the renewal of not only monastic life, but in the entire life of the church throughout the 19th century that you see, for instance, impacting Russia with Optina or Valam 
or, or other great uh, spiritual fathers, uh, such as St. Athanasius, Branson, Enoff, and others who greatly benefited from the text that were brought to, to, to press uh, during the 18th century on Mount Athos. But St. Nicodemus is the person they were running to, as, as we read in the life, uh, because he had passed through himself, purification, illumination. He'd reached, of course, great heights, but also he had become so familiar, so well-versed in the patristic mind, the patristic way. And his books are just phenomenal for the breadth and depth uh, of material that he cites. Uh, one of the things I was, as I was looking through the book again, prepared for tonight, I was just struck by the, you know, endless uh, footnotes that the saint had put uh, 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 underneath all of his comments and the, the comments on the canons of St. John the Faster and others. Uh, and he's citing not just the ascetical texts or patristic texts, but even worldly texts, texts produced by emperors or or by the uh, by the state and things that would come to bear, canons that would come to bear that are not necessarily canons accepted in the ecumenical councils, but, but authoritative uh, in the Church of Constantinople, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just phenomenal. When you read through this book, it's the breadth of knowledge and the depth is really phenomenal. Uh, so Bishop Basil, uh, we're so grateful that he... Uh, in, you know, endorsed, but also supported and supports the work that we do uh, in bringing St. Nicodemus uh, to the English-speaking world. Now, also, as we have an introduction in this book from Father George Metalinos. Uh, Father George, if you don't know who Father George Metalinos is, he is, uh, I don't know how to, how to begin to describe him, but you know, a towering figure in, in contemporary Orthodox Greece, uh, reposed just a few years ago. I was very blessed and I'm grateful to God that I had him as one of my mentors, uh, that I've sat at his feet, feet and, and he helped me with my PhD thesis, and he, he wrote a, uh, a preface to my PhD thesis. And, and I'm so grateful to God for that time with him because he was a really just an extremely wise, spiritual man with much wisdom. He spent most of his life writing, teaching at the University of Athens Theological. He was the dean toward the end of his life for a number of years. And he's well known for all of his historical uh, books on the church during the Ottoman period, and including a very important book that's been translated in English. Not much has been translated in English, unfortunately. I would like to, I'd hope that Uncle Mountain Press can help in that in that direction. But one of the books, the most important books that he translated that that he wrote and is also translated into English, is a very well known book. Uh, I confess one baptism, which, if God wills, we will see soon again circulating in the English language. But Father George was extremely well-versed uh, in the writings of St. Nicodemus and the Holy Fathers uh, during this time period. He writes the introduction for our, for our book. And let me just quote him what he says here, but also I want to discuss a little bit about some of the issues that he's facing in his introduction, which are very helpful for us to understand properly the text uh, that we have before us. He says, I consider the translation and publication in the English language of the Exmolocatarian of the great theologian and father of the church, Nicodemus, Nicodemus the Hagurite, to be a momentous event. It is an important pastoral work which has, from its very first appearance, been of tremendous help both to confessors and those confessing. Uh, father George discusses within his introduction some very important topics that have, that have come out because we have it during this period uh, of the Ottomans. As, as most of you probably already know, during the, especially the 18th, but also the 17th and 19th centuries, we have a uh, Western captivity uh, in, to, to a certain degree and to a certain, uh, in, in certain ways of our theology. In other words, what does that mean? We were heavily influenced by Latin and Western theology in our academic and our academic theology, but also the terminology that then circulated through the 18th, 17th and 18th centuries that became the terminology that people were using and that be, because of the influence of Western texts that were translated or used in the theological schools, what they were in the Ottoman Empire at the time, even St. Nicodemus and others start to use language which is not always used or not used in the, it, it, very much um, in an author, authoritative way among the saints of the first millennium. And so the question then was raised and there were certain critics who were trying to make the point that St. Nicodemus was heavily influenced by the West. But is that the case? And Father George explains very well that although the terminology that he used was the terminology that dominated in the day, he used it in a patristic way. So, for instance, the whole question of the penance. 
and the uh, the satisfaction of this penance not used. It was not used in Saint Nicodemus the way it was used in the West. It was not used uh, in that legalistic, moralistic way that that some people might be familiar with, and is and is criticized today. But it's used in fulfilling the rule given by the spiritual father, which is very much a part of the tradition understanding of the canons, what the role of the spiritual father is in giving those rules, those therapeutic, uh, let's say, practices that go along with confession and, and help to heal the soul so that it does not return to sin. So that's just one example of why his introduction is so important. It also helps us in other ways to understand uh, to properly understand the Orthodox writings during this period in, in other ways, not, not by St. Nicodemus. So if you read that introduction and then you encounter other texts during this period uh, by Dositheos or others, in at times you can properly understand what's going on without, in, without therefore thinking, oh, he means what exactly they were saying, for instance, in the, among the scholastic, for instance. So it, 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 Father George is very masterful in helping us navigate that today because we don't have nearly the knowledge and experience that he has and so we can't you know we can't um, we read it and we kind of walk away and shake our heads and say what well, how could he have spoken in such a way well that's why we have the introduction very important let's go back to the table of contents and let's see if i can make it is it too small on the screen or is it sufficient um let's like make it slightly bigger maybe if i can let's see Um, yeah, hopefully that's readable for y'all. Make that a little bit smaller. So, as you see on the screen, we have this first section. Part one is is an instruction to the spiritual father. And this text, uh, this part is going to be obviously mainly for the priest or the confessor or the or the spiritual father, and he's going to be talking about how what one must be before becoming a spiritual father the knowledge uh of the spiritual father uh concerning the various sins and how to understand uh the various kinds of sins and what they imply uh, he goes to the ten commandments uh in order to lay those out not not a whole lot of pages only about 10 pages on that another 10 pages on the concerning the circumstances of sin concerning thoughts uh very important uh, for the spiritual father and discerning what's happening in the spiritual son or daughter concerning the mystery of repentance chapter seven very important the whole process of what it means to repent concerning an active priesthood and a permission to become a spiritual father uh, in the in the roman slash greek orthodox world apparently contrary to other parts of the orthodox world you did not automatically become a spiritual father when you are ordained to the priesthood you have to be specially blessed by the bishop to become a spiritual father and one of the reasons obviously at that during those that period would have been the state of the people of god having very little if any access to education and so there being a lot of illiteracy among the people. So there were many priests ordained who were village priests who never went to school or went to very little school if they had a school. And one of the things that St. Cosmas did was to, to plant ton, just many schools, I think over 100, 150 schools, I forget the number, but a, an immense amount of schools were started, uh, maybe even more by St. Cosmas during his, during his uh, you know, short period of service to the church during the 18th century. So uh, there were places that did not have an education. So the spiritual father has to have some, obviously, level of education, has to read the patristic text, has to be able to be conversant in these texts. And so uh, there is a process by which one goes through to become a spiritual father. He talks about that here. How to conduct confession, uh, pre-confession counsel uh, for the spiritual father, the penitent. This is about what he does when he becomes a spiritual father. Uh, the spiritual father is not to question how the spiritual father is to listen to sins and many, many other things which we don't have to get into now. But for the priest out there or the future priest, somebody in theological school who's going to be serving the church of priests, this is an invalid. This is this text is absolutely necessary. Uh, if you're have this 
this this uh, responsibility or you may have it you have to read this book you have to study this book and have it close to you uh in order to properly uh carry out the uh, the role of the spiritual father here how he talks about how the spiritual father is assigned a rule uh very important gives various kinds of sins and what they're going to be receiving and how you're going to apply that and what depending on the repentance of the of the person coming and all, all kinds of other things concerning the prayer of forgiveness what is read uh and the spiritual father must not reveal sins and then a essentially an add-on to this whole section how the spiritual father should question those confessing about the chief sins according to the ten commandments and he goes through those and talks about questions uh in probing the various uh kinds of sins that are going to be confessed So let me go back here. This section is very valuable. And one of the things I want to talk about before we get any further is this question of, well, wh why? Uh, there, are, there are not a few people today who say the laymen have no business reading the canons of the, uh, have no business reading the canons of the church. And, and these canons here of St. John the Faster, who we'll talk about in a minute, what, who he was and what canons he gave to the church. Uh, there'll be people who say, you know, the, the layman, the, the, the neophyte has no business even looking at those, reading those or anything like that. And so that's a question. And obviously there are neophytes or, or new Orthodox, very zealous, who might think they have to start applying all of these to themselves without a spiritual father. And that would be very mistaken, obviously. Um, that's not the role of the penitent. Obviously, we have just a section how to apply it all by the spiritual father. Canons are not meant to be self-applied, but to be applied by the church, by the hierarchy of the priest for the healing of the souls. And depending on many circumstances, that penance, the quantity especially, will change. And so we have great spiritual fathers today who are who have been shown and in their life to have been extremely adept at healing the soul and did not apply the letter of the canons, whether they be the ancient canons of St. Basil or the, even the canons of St. John the Faster. And so the there is no there's no assumption that pick up this book, apply as, as read. It's got to be applied with the sermon and prayer by the spiritual father. However, so someone therefore someone said there's no business reading them if you're not going to apply them yourselves, why read them? But they're extremely educational. They're extremely helpful spiritually uh, and reading them brings one to compunction and contrition in many cases and i'll give you just one example which is very unfortunately very common today and that and this is this is something that you know unfortunately we have to speak about more and more because well the, it's a very prominent sin among young people but it's also neglected unfortunately by many spiritual fathers and this is not I'm not speaking off the cuff. I have, I have personal experience, but also many people who've come to me and said as much from their own experiences that this is how they're not healed of this sin. They're not even told how to be healed of this sin. Yes, this, they're confessing. Yes, they're, re they're receiving the, the absolution, but there's no active healing going on practically with a rule of life, a rule of, of uh, repentance. And we're talking about the, the sin of self-abuse, the sin of, uh, uh, of uh, self-pleasure, self-abuse is how it's referred to usually because it's not seen as something that's good, but rather very detrimental. And in this text by St. Nicodemus, when he's talking about this gross sin that, uh, that is, afflicts many, many young people, both men and women, he has an amazing long footnote that it's hard to imagine anyone could read it and not not feel extremely, even if they've not committed the sin, even if they're not committed the sin, they're going to come to, it's very illuminating and it's very convicting and it shows the impact of sin on the soul and the body. This is the patristic wisdom. We need this so much today. We need to be brought to compunction and contrition, but we need to be illumined as to how 
sin destroys both the soul and the body. And so just to give you that one example, I'm not going to read it online because I don't want to put people in difficult positions because something that is, you know, some people do not want to see and cannot see. So I'm not going to do that. But there are many such commentaries on sin in this in this uh, section here on the canons of St. John the Faster, which are extremely convicting and humbling and healing. Because guess what? If you have, if you're inflicted by these sins, you have to go through a process of humbling and contrition and compunction. And this is the role of the spiritual father, but also um, uh, of, uh, uh, of all the, the patristic material that's written on healing of the soul. It's to bring us to this contrition and compunction, to tears, and to a thorough cleansing from the sin internally. And then the resolve and the spiritual strength that comes from that to not go back to the vomit, right? To not go back to the vomit. Now, just to just to read a few of these canons because they're not on the screen here, just so you know what we're dealing with. We're talking about, of course, several common sexual sin, uh, which I'm not going to talk about. But there's even those pollutions that happen in, in the middle of the night, for instance, and what we do. A lot of people don't know that there's there's things that when you when you have this in the dreams and that are polluted and and uh, passionate, you have the 50th Psalm, you have prostrations, 49 prostrations, and, and you read the 50th Psalm every time. A lot of people don't know that. They 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 have spiritual fathers and never tell them that, for whatever reason. Maybe they just forget. Maybe they're maybe they have, they're 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 assuming that people know it. I don't know. There's all kinds of reasons why there might something might happen. But in any case, there are many who do not know about these things, and so this is extremely helpful. And this is these are the kinds of things that. You know, with a simple blessing from the spiritual father, there's no reason why this cannot be applied. Uh, it's not a major, uh, you know, massive rule of no communion for I don't know how long or anything like. These are practical, uh, ex basic practical responses to the falls into these various sins that can be applied fairly quickly and easily across the board to most people. But you still, of course, would go to the spiritual father and say. How do I deal with this sin? And hopefully the spiritual father, again, why we one of the reasons why we produced the book, God and God blessed it, is because the spiritual fathers need this guidance. There's other many other sins that are that are dealt with um, in these canons. Um, many of them, unfortunately, are things that happen today more and more because of our descent into a kind of Sodom and Gomorrah situation. Uh, these sins. Uh, are not uncommon. Um, there's there's many canons that have to do with um, you know very serious sins like murder, uh, but also lots of commentary on what leads to that, which is anger. So you'll see uh, a discussion of the roots of the sin. Uh, there's things that are really quite rare, but happen, uh, and they need a penance. There's also this, a woman who has involuntarily miscarried a baby. What happens? It receives a penance of, according to St. John the Faster, one year. St. Nicodemus talks about that, and there's a lot of commentary on that. Obviously, that would be something that would apply by the spiritual father. But you see, if reading this, what you see is the seriousness of these sins that we would take for granted. Oh, well. Many people would not even think that there would be a penance for something like that. Um, and it's explained why, why this is the case. And in, unless we just don't want to ignore the canonical tradition, ignore the church fathers, because that's that's how many people might deal with this. Well, just ignore that because we can't deal with that. That's so, you know, that's, that's middle ages, nonsense, whatever. Well, if that's the case, well, we have a serious problem, don't we? We're approaching the church fathers and the canons as if they're, irrelevant to our day and they're probably more relevant than ever because of the sin that that is abounding in our day um so i'm not going to go I, i'm looking at various canons that would be something that would be, that'd be applicable to many people some of these are very specific very specific um you know something very strange as well 
If something unclean falls into a well or into oil or into wine, let ever, whoever has tasted it of it not touch meat or cheese for three days and let him commune, for, not commune for seven days. That's going to be strange to uh, modern ears. What's he talking about? Uh, and he explains where this is based. And everything is based in the church fathers. Underneath there are countless church fathers quoted and referenced, even in these strange, very rare cases of, of things. Maybe not for us today. Uh, uh, maybe for us they're, they're rare, but not for those uh, back in the day of St. John the Faster. So they're all explained. Now, there, there are things beyond uh, the canons of the faster. If we go further down in the table of contents uh, in this section, which I found extremely interesting, outside of the canon of the faster. This is St. Nicodemus talking. And I'm going to read to you a few of these um, to illumine what, I mean, very pertinent to our day. And a lot of people are grossly ignorant on these matters. And they're not applied, unfortunately, in our day. Uh, and again, what's the purpose of reading them? To uh, to acquire the mind of Christ, the mind of the church fathers, even if you're not going to apply them and I'm not going to apply them or they're not applicable today uh, or they're not being applied, unfortunately, and there's nothing we can do about that. It is extremely important to us to, to not lose the context and to understand where we are in relation to the patristic norm, right? And it should be extremely humbling. One of the things that this, this book can't but do for anyone who has a spiritual sensitivity is to humble us exceedingly <laughs> and, and to bring us to a, a, um, a knowledge of our poverty today. Uh, if we stand, as some do, unfortunate, very unfortunate people in the church who reject application of canons, don't even bother reading the canons, if that's how we stand, we are to be very, you know, we are, we are to be very... Um, We are very sad people. It's very sad people with such a stance. That's not the proper stance. The proper stance is to humble ourselves, to read them, to acquire the knowledge, and then in that state of, of, uh, of proper understanding of where we're at in respect to the, to the teachings of the fathers, to humble ourselves and to seek to live as much as we can further toward that, that higher goal, not to ignore it, not to dismiss it, but to submit ourselves and to acquire the spirit, at least, if not the letter. Obviously, the letter oftentimes is not applied today. But do you know the following, for instance, concerning those who marry a second or third time? It's a big issue for those who are uh, among the papal Protestants. They they're always criticizing the Orthodox about uh, second and third marriages. This is not evangelical. And the, and the Roman uh, uh, papal Protestants, of course, uh, have the uh, they annul marriages. Uh, but they refuse to allow the idea of a second marriage. And what is the church's teaching on that? I'm not going to get into tonight, but very, very briefly, that the second marriage is not a marriage as the first. It's very different. You'll hear about that in a second. How is it dealt with by the church fathers? And it really is in the realm of penitence. That's why we're talking about it in a book on confession. And so if, if, they, if, if our friends among the papal Protestants would humble themselves a little bit and realize that actually there's a canonical tradition there are canons, there are church fathers who talk about this, these states of penance that happen after the first marriage is dissolved. And there, there would be obviously a lot more to talk about here. It's not, I'm not presenting on this topic tonight and today to apply it pastorally. But if you read this and you understand, wait a minute, the church fathers, yes, they, there was allowance for a so-called second and third marriage. But what did that mean? How is it understood? And what were the consequences that are unfortunately not applied today? Um, and so I'm going to read you this and then just to give you a sense of what St. Nicodemus bear, brings to bear on things that are totally ignored or, or we're totally ignorant of today. And again, the application, I want to stress this, I'm going to stress it many times tonight, the application in our particular lives with our particular people is not made by you or me or even St. Nicodemus or St. John the Faster, but it's made by a priest or bishop who's responsible and he has to apply the mind and the spirit of this of the canons and of the fathers to particular cases today. Now, there may be malpractice. I think there is in many cases, but there are also those who are sincerely trying to apply it in a way that's going to be salvific. And that's always been the case. I mean, there are canons for those who do malpractice as priests and bishops, as uh, is very, very clear, even in this excellent guitar. And so that's nothing new in saying that there's many 
who or or some in any case who are unfortunately practicing you know medicine spiritual medicine with essentially without a license or doing malpractice that's nothing new folks it's just that it may be more in our day because again the gross ignorance of many of our uh clergy not having been trained not having been brought up not having even been introduced to these canons and these uh, and the teachings of saint nicodemus and saint john the faster so what do we expect i guess this is the this is the what we have to expect so hopefully this book will help many and again it's going to require a lot of discernment and how to apply it in each case now he says concerning those who marry a second and a third time Someone who enters into a second marriage, according to Canon 4 of St. Basil the Great. It's very interesting. St. Basil the Great talks about this. This is the 4th century. Is impeded from the divine mysteries for one or two years. So there's a penance for those who have a second or third marriage. Did we know that? Is it applied today? I don't know. I, I don't think so. But that's how the church fathers saw a second and third marriage. It wasn't, hey, let's go get married again. Ha, la, la, ta, la, la. It was... No communion for one or two years because they consider this a fall. They consider this something that was not blessed by God. But at the same time, so that people would not burn and become fornicators and fall away even further from Christ, they applied this medicine. This is something the legalistic mindset of the West has a very difficult time getting their head around. How is it possible for the church to do something which is not explicitly written in the gospel as permissible? Because the church is Christ. And the church and the church fathers are applying the mind of Christ in every age and in the spirit of the gospel, but for particular cases and people so that they might not fall further away or come back in repentance to God. But I'm not, again, I'm going to digress if I go too further in that too much further in that direction. According to Canon 2 of St. Nikiforos and the first response of Nikitas Heraclius, they are neither to be crowned during their second wedding ceremony. So there's no crowning the second ceremony. Some people might be listening and say, well, I'm married a second time and I was crowned. That may be an error. That may be because the first the person you were married was married for the first time. I don't know. There are different ways of, of applying and interpreting what happens when somebody who's married for the first time marries somebody who's married for the second time. Are they both wearing the crowns? Many times they are today. But this, this particular... Um, uh, canon of St. Nikiforo says they're not to be crowned uh, for the second wedding. Nikitas, neither, uh, so you know, uh, forgive me, according to Canon 5 of Nesakaria and the aforementioned Nikitas, neither is the priest who blessed them to, is blessed uh, to eat at their table. So at that second, at that wedding of the second wedding for the two, the priest, according to Canon 5 of Neocasaria, one of the ancient uh, councils, does not give the blessing to the priest to go and sit at the table. This is a way of showing that this is not the first marriage. It's not a, it's not akin to a marriage, which is a great celebratory event, right? This is something different. A third marriage is called, according to St. Gregory the Theologian, a transgression. But it's still called the third marriage. This is, again, something that the Western legalistic mind cannot get their head around. St. Gregory the Theologian, according to St. Nicodemus, and he's citing um, in Oratori 37.8 of Patrocloia Greca 36.292b. It's got the citation right there. Go back to St. Gregory the Theologian's writings. Quote, the first marriage is the law. The second is done out of forgiveness. The third is a transgression. That's quoting St. Gregory the Theologian. For those in the West who say... How could you possibly th speak of a second and third marriage? St. Gregory the Theologian talks about it. What is it, though? That's the question. A third marriage is called a transgression by St. Gregory the Theologian. Canon 4 of St. Basil the Great calls it polygamy. His 80th canon calls it worse than fornication, and the 50th canon calls it a shame and defilement of the church. But they still call it. In other words, it exists. And it's shown to be a fall, but nonetheless, the church is trying to work with those people who have fallen instead of saying you don't exist. You cannot you cannot uh, move forward or anything else. So it's this is the loving therapeutic guidance of those who have fallen into the mud of sin. How do we deal with that? This is what this book is all about. And it's extremely 
eye-opening for all of us, clergy and laymen alike. Canon 4 of St. Basil excommunicates those who marry for a third time for five years from communion. Now he's commemorating the various canons. Those canons need to be applied today. I want you to, I want to, I'm going to say this many times because I really don't want people to walk away and say, hey, you're excommunicated, which is some, what some ignoramus, uh, forgive me for the term, but that's what it would be, an ignoramus would do, right? I'm going to go and just apply these canons uh, as if I'm uh, responsible for applying the canons as, um, as a layman. So we're getting a sense of what the Father said about it. What we do today in each circumstance is going to differ. Joseph Verenios, famous uh, wise and holy um, ecclesiastic it, during the Ottoman period, says that those being married for the first time are engaged, blessed, and crowned. Those being married for the second time are only engaged and blessed and not crowned. And those getting married for a third time are only engaged and this by allowance, but they are neither blessed nor crowned. This is very interesting. as volume three uh, from his works. There's a whole long footnote here uh, going and commemorating uh, various incidences in church history, fascinating historical uh, material about how the church dealt with this matter. Now, going on to something that's very timely today, the Cretan Council dealt with it, innovated about it, this, this disregarded the holy canons, and basically has made de facto marriage between an orthodox and heterodox permissible. Let's read what the canons say about that. Let's read what St. Nicodemus says. And this comes as a major important correction to contemporary practice and why people don't want us to read the Exomogatarian or don't want us to read the Pedalian, because what's going to be apparent to most of us is we are in serious trouble, brothers and sisters. We have departed from the rule of the fathers for 2,000 years in some places by some people. I shouldn't say across the board by any means. Certain hierarchs, certain priests, certain dioceses are saying, you know, in taking advantage of the idea that we're going to apply the canon, they go ahead and basically overturn the canon. This is what's happening. And, and they're going to say, no, 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 we're applying it pastorally. Well, you can't overturn it and apply it pastorally. You can't simply trample on it and say it doesn't exist any longer for all intents and purposes and still be in the spirit of economia, right? Economia is a temporary a temporary departure which returns to ecclesia. You cannot simply overturn it. And when we're talking about marriage between an Orthodox Christian and the heterodox, now we're in the realm of dogma. Why? Because this is about the church now. Because how does the non-Orthodox participate in the sacrament of marriage when they're not baptized, chrismated, or communing? You, under, you do know that the sacrament of marriage, like all the mysteries, took place in the Eucharistic synaxes. And in the contemporary practice, we have the drinking of the bottle of wine or the, the cup of wine by the, the soon-to-be wed husband and wife, soon-to-be husband and wife. We have them drinking the cup of wine. Well, what was that? But the Eucharist, now we have it for a variety of reasons, which I think is unfortunate, frankly. We should return to having the, the, the marriage in the synaxes, in the Eucharistic synaxes. That's where it belongs, like all the mysteries. In any case, that practice harkens back to the Eucharistic synaxes, which means what? That it's assumed, as you'll see in many canons, that they are both orthodox. And theologically and dogmatically, there is no defense. I've never seen any defense anywhere by anyone <laughs> in any sense, stretch of imagination. That it's indefensible theologically, dogmatically to make sense of our, not our practice, but a practice that, that some Orthodox are doing around the world today. And that is marrying an Orthodox Christian to a non-Orthodox Christian, heterodox Christian, whatever it is. There's no sense to it. You cannot explain it because it's the presupposition for two people to be united in Christ in that third person is that they're both already in the body of Christ. They're already united individually to Christ. Now they're going to be united to them, each other in Christ. How is one united in Christ when they're not in the body of Christ? It's impossible to explain theologically. It is simply this massive departure now that has been blessed. It says, Cross the board, go for it, do it. It's blessed. It is reckless, if, if, if not totally 
um, you know, an overturning of the of the dogmatic conscience of the church on this level. So now, having said that, I think everything I said is based in the fathers. Let's hear what St. Nicodemus says in this section concerning, as it says here in D, concerning marriage between an Orthodox and a heretic or heterodox, 207. He says, Canon 14 of the Fourth Ecumenical Council, Canon 10 and 31 of Laodicea, and Canon 29 of Carthage, forbid Orthodox Christians from marrying heretics or the heterodox. All right? That's three canons from local councils. Well, the first is the Fourth Ecumenical Council, and then there's two canons from Laodicea, which was received in Trullo, and Canon 29 of Carthage. So that's pretty strong. Then we go to Canon 72 of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. That's the canons accepted in Trullo. And it dissolves the marriage between an Orthodox Christian man or woman and a heretic and renders it invalid. That's the canon referenced at Crete, which was basically overturned. For all intents and purposes, it was relativized. In practice, it's been relativized, right? Why is it that they would want to dissolve that wedding, that marriage that's been done apparently illegally or, uh, you know, without the blessing of the of the church in some, some way or another. Somehow they were married. Again, it's on the basis that it's impossible to, re, re, to, re, um, to reconcile with the dogma of the church. It's impossible to reconcile it. And so the church fathers then said, if it happens, it cannot be kept. It cannot be permitted. It cannot be tolerated. Today, again, we're not only tolerating it, we're celebrating it in certain archdioceses in America. And again, I'm not saying in judgment of anyone or any bishop. That's their de decision. I'm just a simple priest. I'm describing what's going on. That's all I'm doing. And I'm and, and we're talking about St. Nicodemus and ex Mugatarian and what he brings to bear. And we should all have to deal with it. Like what our role here in publishing this book and all, my role here in presenting it to you tonight is what? To bring you face to face, all of us, priests, bishops, clergy, laymen, face to face with what the church fathers teach, what the church has always accepted, what the canons and the fathers in, with one voice teach, so that we can stay on the path of salvation. We're going, in some cases, in some places, off the rails. And it is it is urgent that we be corrected and brought back to the narrow path. He goes on. Balsamon says that an Orthodox Christian man or woman and a heterodox, I'm sorry, but Balsman says that an Orthodox person who married a non-Orthodox or heterodox is not permitted to commune in the divine mysteries unless they first separate and are penanced. That's Balsamon. You know, Balsman is one of the great uh, commentators on, on the canons. In his day, people ran to him. And, and, and asked his uh, guidance on how to understand the canons. It's so interesting today to watch certain people, certain academics, certain hierarchs, quoting whenever it feels appropriate certain canons that will support their power or their authority. But these kind of canons, which shows them to be, to shows them to be innovators, nobody ever talks about. <laughs> nobody wants to talk about what Balsman has to say about this topic, right? Because we're totally in violation of it. This is what's got to come to an end. It, I'm not saying that, that we're going to suddenly... In, you know, on a dime, correct course. I don't know. I'm not responsible for that. Everybody's got to do what they got to do. But it, it, we've got to come to terms with our departure. We've got to come to terms with where we are, right? We've got to come and be humbled. And that's part of the process of, of salvation. So Simeon of Thessaloniki, St. Simeon of Thessaloniki, one of the great church fathers at the end, or the beginning, rather, of the Ottoman period, um, you know, right at the end there, and before the fall of, of Thessaloniki, uh, he, he's got his Apanda, his huge collection of texts on many topics. One of the great confessors against papal Protestantism, one of the great teachers about the liturgical life and all the meaning of everything we do liturgically. One of the church fathers that needs to be set, needs to be in, um, translated into English very much. What does he say? What does he say? This is in the 15th century, right? 14th century. Says the same thing. Adding that the person is not to receive communion until the end of their life, 
having the service of unction first read over them, if they repent, that is. This sounds extremely harsh, doesn't it, to our ears? What? We know all kinds of mixed marriages going on today. Well, what do we do with that? Let's come to terms with what we're doing. What is this? How are we doing it? Why are we doing it? Is it salvific? Is it blessed? Do the church fathers endorse it? I'm just bringing us, I'm just the messenger. People love killing messengers today. I, I'm looking, you know, I'm, I'm expecting, and I've been told to expect that I'll be having a lot of arrows shot at me in the immediate future because of exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm giving you the message that the fathers teach, and that's not welcome today. Kill the messenger. Hit, hit, hit him hard. Shut him up because he's going to create division, right? That's the word that I'm hearing. I'm divisive because I'm telling you what St. Nicodemus teaches. I didn't, how can that be the case? Is St. Nicodemus is, we said in the beginning of this live cast, live stream, he was entered into the role of saints by the ecumenical patriarch and indeed by Athenagoras, one of the greatest humanist and uh, hierarchs of our 20th century in grave error. And yet he, before he began that, that many of his uh, most outlandish practices in the 60s, he enrolled St. Nicodemus into the, uh, uh, among the saints. Uh, so, again, if you want to kill the messenger, that's fine, but that's all I am, and this is what the saints are saying. And he's, commemor he's doing the same thing, by the way. St. Nicodemus is saying, here's what the saints say. That's what we should do in every age. Every one of us should say, oh, what do the saints say? I don't know. I'm nobody, all right? But the saints say that. Everybody take take uh, and do what you want with it, but that's what the saints say, all right? The priest is neither to remove a portion of the lamb, according to St. Simeon, the theologian, and commemorate the person at the prophecies. He's considered basically outside the church, apparently. I don't. That's, that's what that, that action means. When you don't commemorate them at the prophecies, it means that they've fallen away. If they're unrepentant, apparently, right? And they, they, they continue in, in the state that they, they entered into. Nor accept that person's offerings to the church, but only sometimes to accept candles and incense. And sometimes, not always, give that person holy water and andidron in order that he may not fall into despair and to direct him to give alms. These, admittedly, these practices are not happening today, even by great spiritual fathers. They're not doing what St. Simeon and Theologian said. So you might say, well, what's the point then? Well, that's how they understand that they can apply it today. That's why, again, all of this, what you're hearing, has to be applied case by case. But the fact that we're totally ignoring what they're teaching today, and we're ignoring it not just because we're not applying it. I don't mean we're not we're ignoring it and not applying it. I mean, we're ignoring that it even exists. And we're ignoring the dogmatic consciousness that they're expressing here, right? In this case, it's really expressing a dogmatic consciousness, which we don't want to hear in the age of ecumenism. He goes on. The Codex of Justinian, Book 1, Title 5, Ordinance 12. Again, very broad and deep, his quoting and his uh, his knowledge. Amazing. In, in, the, in the 1780s and 90s on Mount Athos, he had access to unbelievable material in, that we don't even, you know, a lot of us don't even know about today. Says that if there is a dispute between the parents who managed in some way to get married, the parent who desires to make the children orthodox is to prevail. Ordinance 18 of the same title says the same thing. So he goes and he gives references, all right? So that's just one little section. He got, has many other sections. He talks about offerings that are not accepted. He talks about concerning fasting on Wednesday and Friday. I wanted to read this whole section to you, but I think we're not going to be able to do that in time. Very interesting. Many of us don't know. We don't know what the church fathers teach on Wednesday and Friday, right? And when we don't fast on Wednesday and Friday, what are the consequences? And that fasting on Wednesday and Friday, according to the fathers, according to the monastics that to this day, but according to the church fathers in, in this canon, means one meal after the ninth hour. Let me just read a few lines from this section, then we're going to move on. And I want to move to the council for the penitent. But this is really interesting. Canon 69 of the Holy Apostles de designates that any hierarch or priest or deacon or subdeacon or reader or chanter or anybody in any authority in the church, anybody in any service liturgically who does not fast during Great Lent and Wednesday and Friday is to be deposed. All right. So if you're a deacon, a subdeacon, a reader, a chanter, a priest, a hierarch, anybody, and you do not fast. Of course, 
it means that you're healthy and you can fast. If you're sick, obviously, this does not apply. But if you intentionally leave off Wednesday and Friday fasting and great Lent and the other fasts, you would be deposed from this, from your place and your role. Now, again, that doesn't mean that they're just not eating meat on Wednesday and Friday. What they're talking about, the fast of Wednesday and Friday is just like the fast of great Lent. And that means that we're eating oilless food, no wine, no oil, and we're eating one meal a day. That's what is it, the saints have in mind when they're talking about fasting on Wednesday and Friday. Now, again, I understand that many of us don't do that. I understand that most of us don't do that. And I'm not saying that you're therefore going to be deposed if you're a priest. What I'm saying is let's humble ourselves and see how poor we are. Let's admit our poverty. Let's admit our weakness. Let's humble ourselves and not have big ideas about who we are. We're nobodies. We're nobodies, folks. We can't even keep the basics anymore. Let's humble ourselves. This is why this book is so important for all of us. It brings us to contrition, to humility, to a right self-knowledge, to a pignosis, to knowledge of ourselves, of who we are. When you see these people standing up after five or ten years in the church, they went to theological school, they're teaching from their, from their soapbox, and they're never quoting church fathers. In fact, they're doubting them, undermining them. Flee. Flee from such people. Flee from people who say, we don't need St. Nicodemus. We don't need St. Cyprian. We don't need these saints. Flee from them. They're not leading you on the, na on the narrow path. Very dangerous time period in our church when these are our teachers who would tell you flee from the canons as opposed to flee from the heretics, for instance. No, we're going to go and have, you know, common prayer. We're going to go and do common cause. But St. Nicodemus, don't read, right? What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? St. Nicodemus, again, on the fa concerning fasting on Wednesday and Friday, and he's quoting the canons of the Holy Apostles. He's quoting the saints of our church. If a layman does not fast during these times, unless he cannot fast on account of bodily illness, he is to be excommunicated. So the layman, not the clergyman, the layman, he says, is excommunicated until he starts to fast, according to the church fast. You don't go to communion if you're just blowing off the fast of the church. St. Sarah from Sarah famously said, if you don't fast, you can't be an Orthodox Christian. It's that simple because it's a question of obedience. It's a question of following the Holy Fathers and submitting to Christ. And you're saying, no, I'm not interested. Well, then you cannot commune unto salvation, right? Because that stance is one of pride and arrogance. I'm just seeing a comment by Johnny Beham. Yeah, Johnny, it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone in the sense that not everyone can hear it, but we've got to, somebody has to say it, right? And somebody has to begin to, 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 to bring it to bear so that we can start to hear it, right? We can't hear it because we're conditioned not to hear it. We're, we're conditioned by the world and by innovative uh, teachers to not hear this, right? So the more we read, the more we are, become immersed in the saints and the fathers, the more our ears start to hear and our heart starts to break and our mind starts to be crucified and therefore to be illumined, right? So it's extremely important. Yes, I'm saying bitterness for a lot of people. I understand that. I understand these words are, come as ha hard words, right? But that's exactly what the Lord said to the Pharisees, right? He said it to his own disciples. You remember what, what happened? He said, you got to eat my body and drink my blood. And he, re and he said it again and again and again. He didn't say, and when they, oh, how? No, again. And then they turned away and he let them go, right? The Lord did not chase after them and say, let me make it easy. The hard words, oh, these are hard words. We cannot hear these words. And they walked away and he let them go. So that, that's a part of the gospel, right? That's how the gospel was preached. It was not always preached to make it easy. You know, it wasn't always sweet. Sometimes it was bitter and that bitterness like St. Nicodemus says in this book, it's like a pill that's bitter, but it get, makes you well. It makes you well. It heals you, right? So this is this is bitter, but it's healing if we allow it to be healing. That's why uh, we're reading it. It's for the sake of healing, ultimately, not for the sake of despair or depression or anything like that. St. Nicodemus, do you see 
how the apostles numbered the Wednesday and Friday fast together with the great fast, the, the fast of great Lent. Therefore, just as the fast of great Lent consists in eating dry foods, namely to eat but once a day at the ninth hour without consuming oil or wine, likewise, the fast for Wednesday and Friday is to be conducted in the exact same manner. That's St. Nicodemus. Now, there are people who say, wait a minute, you know, my diocese, my bishop, my priest says that we can eat oil on Wednesday and Friday. Okay, that's your call. That's his call. That's the bishop's call. I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm nobody. But they need to read St. Nicodemus to make sure that they're on the narrow path. That's what I would suggest only. I don't know. They don't have to listen to St. Nicodemus. What's the reason for that? Is that a patristic decision they made? Is it something that we've done for millennia? Is it something that, I mean, what is that all about and why? And how does it help us spiritually? Uh, that's Those are some of the questions I would ask if, if somebody were to come and say, well, but my bishop, priest, and diocese and patriarchate says we can eat oil on Wednesday and Friday. I say, okay, go for it. But maybe you ought to consider why you're doing that and why it's different than St. Nicodemus and why it's different than the 68th, 69th canon and, and the rest we're going to talk about. St. Epiphanius says, we fast on Wednesday and Friday until the ninth hour. Likewise, Philostorgios says that the fast of Wednesday and Friday does not consist in the abstention from meat. Rather, it designates that one is not to eat any food until the evening. St. Benedict in Canon 41 also designates that the fast of Wednesday and Friday is until the ninth hour. Balsaman forbids the consumption of shellfish on Wednesday and Friday. That's the understanding, at least in Greece, in my experience, is that shellfish, shrimp, clams, whatever, they go along with oil. You eat oil, you eat shellfish. You don't eat shellfish, you don't eat oil. Those two go together. And that's exactly what Balsaman is saying here. Let us therefore stop insensibly, St. Nicodemus, let us therefore stop insensibly thinking that the fast of Wednesday and Friday is not an apostolic directive. For behold, the apostles in their canons number this fast together with that of great Lent. And in the apostolic constitutions, they numbered together with the fast of Holy Week, saying, one must fast during Holy Week and Wednesday and Friday. That's Apostolic Constitutions, Book 5, Chapter 20. We oftentimes hear people say, what about the Didache? What about the Apostolic Constitutions? What? And they love to quote from the early church fathers, but sometimes they, they, they forget about these other, the other, other parts of the, of the Constitutions. We therefore, he says, forgive me, but what? why should I say, that this res res regulation is only of the apostles. It is a regulation of Christ himself. For this is what the apostles say in book 5, chapter 14 of the Constitutions. He, that is Christ, commanded us to fast on Wednesday and Friday. Have you ever heard that? You've heard Protestants say, we don't need to fast. Who says fast? And blah, 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 blah. The Lord, according to the apostolic constitutions, commands us to fast on Wednesday and Friday. The Lord himself. But if you don't accept the apostolic constitutions because only the Bible and only the New Testament counts, then you're not going to have the words of the Lord to the apostles as recorded in the apostolic constitutions. We therefore fast on these days according to the holy higher martyr Peter, canon 15, who says, On Wednesday, because of this day, the council of the Jews was gathered to betray our Lord on Friday, because on this day he suffered death for our salvation. And Jerome, the divine Jerome, says the same thing. Look, I could go on for pages, but I want to give you a sense of what this book brings to bear. It's unparalleled. There's nothing like it in the English language. The citations, the canons, the fathers, the, the case that's made for all of the practices of the church and all of the boundaries laid down uh, of, the, of the fathers throughout the ages, which are oftentimes flaunted today to our own detriment, if we cannot get back to Acrevia, which I think is going to be very hard, at least let's be aware of the Acrevia. At least let us kneel before the Holy Fathers in all humility and accuse ourselves. That would be a very beneficial and profitable thing for us. One last section is very interesting, very interesting. And I'm just going to go for that. And then I want to go on the penitent and then we'll open it up for questions. I think I see they're already one hour and 14 minutes in. I don't want to tire you unnecessarily although it's we could go for hours maybe i ought to do a nine hour 
um, live stream like certain other. Uh, no, I'm never doing a nine hour live stream ever, ever, ever. Okay, monks and higher mark higher monks are to reside in their monasteries, and they should not be in the world involved in ecclesiastical and political affairs. Let me read that again. Monks and higher monks are to reside in their monasteries, and they should not be in the world involved in ecclesiastical and political affairs. He's got a whole section here going through. Canon, he begins, Canon 4 of the Holy Fourth Ecumenical Council states the following. Let them who truly and without any hypocrisy enter upon monastic life be accorded due honor. But inasmuch as some use the monastic schema as a pretext and lure to get themselves honored and to disturb ecclesiastical and civil affairs by wanting to meddle in them and by carelessly going about the cities neglecting their duties and even undertaking to build themselves monasteries, he means without any blessing from the local hierarchy, it seemed reasonable that no monk, either in a village or in a city or in a desert or in any other place, shall be allowed to build or establish a monastery or a prayer house without the approval of the local bishop. And that monks in every city and country might subject, be subject to the local bishop, and that they are to practice stillness and pay heed only to fasting and prayer, remaining in the monasteries wherein they were tonsured, unless as a matter of need and necessity they are be appointed to do so by the bishop, after he has judged them to be fit for such an undertaking. Anyone that violates this canon shall be excommunicated in order that the monastic order not be blasphemed and on account their name of the name of God also, on, on their account, the name of God also be blasphemed. In other words, to save them from blaspheming. Brothers and sisters, we have a massive problem in the Orthodox Church today. This canon and this, 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 this analysis, he goes on another two pages, is extremely contemporary and urgently needed because why i could go on for the whole next 45 minutes talking about this it's extremely important in the church i'm just going to talk about the church of greece but this applies i think in many local churches in the 18th century 19th century rather 19th century there was a concerted effort on the part of the rulers of the greek people then the bavarians the various europeans that were meddling in and ruling and guiding the people of greece after the revolution the same people who shut down every monastery in the kingdom of Greece at the time, in I think 1850, all of Peloponnesus, all, all of the southern Greece, the monasteries were shut down. The monks were kicked out, right? These are the same people who then established this idea of the Archimandrite of theology. What's that about? Well, this idea that we're going to have monks in the world. We're going to have monks of theology. They're going to go through theological school. They're going to be educated, and then they're going to be made archimandrites, or they're going to be put in parishes, and eventually we'll have them be the bishops of tomorrow. That was a concerted effort to imitate the West and to transform the monastic life into make it a secular service to the state and to the people, right? We have today in the 20th century, most bishops— are not from the monasteries. They've not, they've not lived in the monasteries. They've not gone through the process of becoming a monk and going through the process of monastic life, purification, and obedience, right? And so this canon comes and judges us today and our practices and says, what are you doing? Yes, we take from the monasteries those exceptional monastics who the bishop and the abbot determine can serve the people of God as confessors and maybe bishops. That's an ancient tradition back in the first millennium. But no, from the Fourth Ecumenical Council on, we don't allow for monastics, hieromonks, to become parish priests. That's not the orthodox way. Did you know that? A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people say, well, that's not a good idea. Yes, it is. It's a great idea. It's a perfectly good idea. <laughs> unless they're coming to live the monastic life with the bishop in a in a monastic house they have no business according to the canons of the church to be parish priests did you know that that's what the canons is with saint nicholas he goes on therefore peter the archivist following the sacred canon says that monks should not be sponsors for children undergoing holy baptism that's another issue today we have a lot of sponsors from of monastics 
And that's something that there has been a lot of economy. And I think that actually, interestingly, has some basis because there's been there's such massive spiritual need among the people that has been judged that the, the example and prayers of the monastics today might help. But that's a great a great exception to the rule. The rule is no. That's the rule. And this is an economy that needs to be really carefully considered every time that it's done. It is done today, and it's done in Greece and other places. But again, for the grave spiritual need of the people, sometimes that happens. That's different. I think it's much less grievous and problematic than leaving the monastery entirely and living among worldly people, and living among the, the people, not having the pastoral experience that a parish priest would have as a married man, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the fo it follows according to the above-mentioned canons. He goes through various canons. The so-called higher monks should not be ordained in or be assigned to parishes in the world. For they are also monks according to their name and have professed to be chaste, as we said in, before in subject one, subject I rather. So that they should be ordained in monasteries and practice their priesthood there and not in the world in church parishes. This is the Athenite monk speaking, right? He's not against them going like St. Cosmas into the world and teaching. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a systematic undermining of the monastic life on the one hand and the parish life on the other. All right, I'm going to stop there because there's, there's much more, and it's very interesting. But I think one of the big problems that we have in the contemporary Orthodox Church is this is this is this uh, large pool of monastics who never really spent time in a monastery. They went to theological school. They were they were tonsured. Never never stayed extended stay in the monasteries. Didn't have to be obedient, particularly in the monastic setting. Lived in apartments you know, got their master's or PhD, and now they're being made bishops throughout the Orthodox world. That's a problem, folks. That's not the spirit of the fathers. That's not why the fathers chose the bishops from the monasteries, obviously. And St. Nicodemus in this book uh, brings this to bear, among many, many other topics. Now, let's go on briefly to part three, which is the most important part, why many of you will buy this book, because it's tremendous in its call, in its not only call, but in its illustration of what it means to repent, right? So he begins, how everyone should prepare for confession. What is repentance? The aspects of repentance, contrition, affliction, confessing to an experienced spiritual father. How one is to examine his conscience. Very, very important. How do you examine your conscience? Sin wrongs God in three ways. Sin wrongs the sinner in three ways. Sorrow over temporal goods is futile. Very interesting. Chapter two, how the sinner should confess. So how to prepare and now how to confess. The meaning of confession, just like we have what is repentance and what is confession. Confession must be voluntary, compunctionate, accusatory. In other words, self-accusatory. Honest, without shame. Manifest, it, it, sin, sins will be, man, be made manifest either now or then. I'm not sure what he means by then. Um, I'd have to go back and read that. If a single, single sin is unconfessed, the other sins are also remain unforgiven. Very interesting, right? If you, if you go to confession and you say, oh, I'm going to say all that, but that one right there, I'm going to keep back because I'm ashamed of that. I can't say it to my spirit of God. I'm ashamed. I'm a, what's he going to say? You walk away unforgiven, according to St. Nicodemus. Confession must be resolute. Chapter three, a sinner is to accept his rule with joy. The meaning of satisfaction. This is very interesting. This is what he unpacks and uses the term satisfaction. What he means is fulfilling the rule, which is a therapeutic practice that helps you not go back to sin and overcome and be purified of sin. Examples of people placed under a rule for their sins. Whoever keeps their rule is a genuine child of the church. It's a question of obedience, right? It's a question of not listening to the enemy who's whispered in our ear like he did Adam and Eve. You don't have to obey. You don't have to obey. The penitent should be of his own accord, seek even a greater rule. Oftentimes, the stance of the penitent is saying, I need more therapy, more 
frustrations, more prayer. That's the stance of a penitent. The sinner will receive either a temporary rule now or an eternal rule then. A penitent must maintain the abstention from communion if he has that as, as a part of the rule. Precautions after confession, remembrance of sins, avoidance of causes of sin, frequent confession, remembrance of the last things, knowledge of sin. Who talks about this? Where are you going to go to get this information? Where is this, this total, complete, and, and thorough examination of what we're talking about? Where does it exist? In one volume. Very hard to find this. It exists here and there, but not like this. Knowledge of sin according to sin in and of itself. Knowledge of sin according to circumstances. The sinner, the cause, the place, the time, the evil results. Knowledge of sin according to the three punishments it received. The punishment of sin in the angels, sin in men. And punishment of sin in the person of Jesus Christ. Very interesting. We could maybe unpack that for a future thing. Prayer. Now, a very, very beneficial, soul profiting homily on repentance. Homily on repentance. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. There we go. The harm caused to salvation of those who sin with the hope of confessing and repenting. You sin and you say, don't worry, I can always con confess and repent after my sin, right? People who do that, what happens? Excessive amount of sins, excessive gravity of sins. The boasting, the disregard, the unrepentance, the denial. He goes through this whole danger for those who have such boldness, right, that they they consciously sin, thinking, I'll go to confession afterwards. Concerning the treatment of those who sin with the hope that they will confess and repent. Again, it goes through this whole section. And the treatment, the pain of heart, why this grief must be perpetual, repentance, etc., etc. All these very soul-profiting and convicting uh, words from St. Nicodemus on how we need to stand, how we need to approach and how we need to, to go deeper into repentance. There's indexes for the scriptures. There's index for the subjects of names. And I think we've covered the basics uh, of the book. We can go and um, let me see if I want to. I don't think I have any comments immediately. I think we'll probably see a lot of questions from you and we can talk about them. So why don't we collect the questions? Justin, I think we might have questions over um, in uh, Crowdcast. We might have questions over on the Telegram channel. But let's start with the questions that we see already here in tele in um, uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook. First question. <clears throat> How do we find a spiritual father? Well, there is no simple answer to that except that you pray fervently and you consider very seriously before you enter into that relationship ideally your circumstances will also play a big part if you're in uh, a place where there is an abundance of them let's say in northern greece where you have an abundance of spiritual fathers from mount athos and other places obviously that will be a different process if you're in you know western um uh, Australia or um, Idaho, or I don't know where. I mean, Idaho actually has a number of parishes, but you understand what I mean. There's places where it's very difficult. You have to travel. In many places, in my experience, one will either, by the grace of God, be able to find a spiritual father nearby in a parish or in their own parish, which is quite ideal. But many times they cannot. Many times they don't feel comfortable. They don't connect. They don't understand or agree or whatever. There's a variety of things that make it difficult for them to submit to a priest or even their own priest. Uh, by the way, in Greece, we do not have this idea, which some people have in America, that you must take the parish priest as a spiritual father. I've never heard that, never seen it, never imagined that it could be enforced like there are parishes where the priest enforces this and says, you cannot. And if you want to be a part of this parish, you must come to me. I It's simply unfathomable for me in my experience from Greece and, 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 and in America, the limited experience I have in uh, the Russian church abroad. I don't think that's possible. 
to even talk like that. This this is a question of freedom. You know, you can't force somebody to marry somebody. You can't force somebody to go to a spiritual father. So in my in my experience, understanding you have to find it. You have to submit yourself voluntarily, of course. And this is a, oftentimes a search. It takes time and pa and patience and prayer. And it may in the Western world where there's not that many monasteries or parishes are far away, it may mean that you have to actually get in a plane or a car and travel to monasteries or other parishes or, or what, it, what it might be to find that spiritual father. Uh, I was counseled early on by a, a very wise bishop that this is the most important decision I'm going to make. It's extremely important that I be patient and perseverant, that I pray, and that in due time, God will send uh, the person. I'll know and that's exactly what happened. I met met him, and I immediately understood this is my spiritual father. It was a very kind of spiritual event, and I was very much at peace. I was just drawn in, and I felt, you know, at home. I was like a long lost father uh, or, or or friend, and that's that's kind of, at least in my experience, that's how you kind of knew this was your spiritual father. Now. That's, I'm not saying it's a universal experience. I'm not saying it has, you have to do that. I'm just trying to give you some insight how, how it may happen. In any case, it needs to be a, pray, a decision you pray about, you search, you take your time, you make that decision, and then you submit. And then you submit. Now, only if a spiritual father becomes very problematic in terms, in terms of not teaching the Orthodox faith, or he himself falls away from from practices that are basic, you know, into grave sins, and I don't know what else, then you you can be released and you can walk away. Uh, you can also just, you can also say, look, I would like to go and find another spiritual father, give me a blessing. And most spiritual fathers would say, you're blessed to go. I don't know of anybody who would say, no, you cannot leave. It just doesn't make, doesn't, it's not the orthodox way and ethos. So yes, you will submit, etc. But you can walk away. Doesn't mean it's always spiritually beneficial to do that, especially in a monastic setting. This would be seen as something really problematic and a challenge to the to your spiritual life to submit yourself to a spiritual father and then five years later say, "I'm out of here, bye bye." And that would not usually be something blessed. I mean, there are exceptions to everything. There are always some exceptions somewhere, but as a norm, that would be problematic. And I would say. You should not enter into a relationship with a spiritual father with with that kind of flippant, you know. Well, maybe I'll just you know I'll, I'll get up and leave kind of approach. Uh, but if it does come to that, because the the spiritual father has now innovated uh, in terms of faith, or uh, you know is 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 practicing something that's really problematic according to the patristic teaching, obviously. Um, it's a problem and you can you can ask a blessing and leave and go for, to the church of father but anyway the process is that i think it's a basic um you know prayer discernment patience go visit meet go again go a third time ask will you be my spiritual father um or 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 go to them and say do you know anybody you can recommend in my area uh you know at a nearby monastery or something like that so that's that's usually how it works Is it true the Catholic Church was originally Christian? I'm still unsure about the Catholic Church being a Christian branch. Uh, I, apparently, you are a Protestant asking this question, a Reformed Protestant. Well, it depends what you mean by Catholic Church. Uh, this is Tommy Creator who's asking this. Um, the Catholic Church is often understood to be uh, the one church under the Pope in Rome, uh, but the term Catholic Church properly and historically and patristically is applied to the church that has confessed the same creed, the same faith for 2,000 years, uh, the, the, the particular creeds that were adopted and embraced by the ecumenical councils, the Nicene and Constantinople creed, which we often refer to as the Nicene creed, that faith, uh, uh, that, that confession of faith there in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church that is the Catholic Church that confesses the same faith for 2,000 years. That's the Orthodox Church that has not innovated, not departed, uh, did not add to the creed like the Filioque and therefore depart from the council's faith and also the rules set down by the councils. And so if you're talking about the what we call the papal Protestant confession, 
under the Pope, then we would say that is a heresy that was developed in the 11th century, departed from the communion of the church, departed from the faith of the church, and has been, unfortunately, on a trajectory far from orthodoxy ever since, adding innovation after innovation after innovation. That is a hard saying for many people. Maybe many, some of you tonight are uh, Roman Catholics, uh, and you don't want to hear that. And, and I don't want to upset you, but that is the truth historical and theological truth and that's the understanding of the church fathers and the, the fathers of the orthodox church so i am required to say plainly and simply the truth and you you're free to do whatever you think is right but um that's my answer for for you if you're a, a reformed protestant you should also understand that you are very close to the papal protestants in other words the latin or roman catholic uh confession uh, in many ways, you share a lot of things in common, including the filioque. And so from the Orthodox perspective, the Pope, that Pope in the 11th century was the first Protestant. And the Reformed Protestants followed his example and created many, many other small Protestant confessions. Uh, both have a stance of rejection of the patristic consensus, rejection of the authority of the church for 2000 years rejection of the faith of nicaea uh, innovation upon innovation so much more similar is papal and reformed protestantism than either of them are to orthodoxy it's good but how could some of this stuff not turn people into puritanical hysteronics um again if people become puritanical hysteronics, that's fr they're free to do that. They can do that without this. They can, they've done it and proven it in the Puritans of the Protestant Reformation. It's, it is not these teachings that turn anybody into anything. It's how they're understood and applied. And that's why I said maybe 10 times during this discussion tonight, all of this is applied by the pastor, the shepherd, the physician of souls. But it's beneficial for us to become aware of it and to have in mind the patristic consensus, the patristic mind, to be humbled before it, for, to see our own selves in light of it, and therefore to approach in great humility the physician and to have these things applied, hopefully salvifically, uh, in our particular case. So none of this exactitude of the gospel as applied in these various instances of mixed marriages or second and third marriages or whatever we talked about tonight, none of that is puritanical. None of that is uh, legalistic. It's a it's showing you the narrow path. It's showing you the patristic witness. If If we can't handle that, then we need to humble ourselves and say, I don't know. I don't know. I can't understand. I'm nobody. And I seek knowledge and I pray that God illumine me. And I follow the saints and the elders today who are applying this. I follow the bishops and priests who are faithfully applying this. Uh, and, you know, I don't have to understand everything. You don't, nobody's, nobody, you don't have to understand most of what I said tonight. It's okay. Right? But what you, what you can't do is just simply disregard it and say it doesn't exist. That's not possible if you want to walk the narrow path. Question, what is the best edition of the Apostolic Constitution in English? Which one should I get? I cannot answer that for you. I don't know. There are a number of things online. Uh, I didn't know there was, uh, you know, a, a real issue with the with the um, manuscript that we have competing translations. And, 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 and uh, uh, so I'm not familiar with that question to answer it. I have we have the Greek version. There's only one version in Greek. Does the number of marriages. Marriages apply canon. Does the number of marriages canon apply? I'm not sure what that means. To converts who were married multiple times before converting. Okay, so the question of multiple marriages. No, the sacraments, the mysteries of the church are in and of the church. There's no basis for me to say that the heterodox ceremonies are the mysteries of the church. We've talked about this. Mysteries don't exist outside of the body. The body is identifiable it's in a particular time and place just like christ was it has a particular faith and confession of faith everything is taken for granted 
The canonical boundaries are taken for granted in these all of the writings of the fathers. All of this uh, relativization of the church today is a fruit of ecumenism. It's not in that you cannot find it. You will not find that in the writings of the church fathers, this idea that um, there are mysteries outside the church. Uh, so what, what is going on in those ceremonies? What, what people are receiving? That's a question we could talk about. But what it, we know it's not is the mysteries that are of, of and in the church. Is it something that God uh, honors, the desire, the intention, uh, the, uh, the piety of people seeking to uh, be one with God, to be married in, uh, by God? All of that, uh, I, can't, I think the church can embrace it to a certain point and, and honor the faithfulness of people who are coming to the church, married uh, as my father and mother were in the Anglican church and faithfully were together for 50 years. Obviously, the church is going to embrace that faithfulness. That's a different question. They're going to celebrate that faithfulness. That's a different question. We're, we're not talking in that subjective manner with these particular people about the mysteries, what a mystery is, what the sacrament is, what the church is, right? That's a, two, two different things. We have to make that distinction. It's not made easily in Protestantism. They identify that. When you say, look, you're not in the church, immediately they run to conclusions about uh, the judgment and salvation, which may or may not be true. And and the the idea that, you know, somebody said recently, uh, you know, the saints like St. Cyprian taught that outside of the church, there is unmitigated darkness. No, he did not teach that. No saint ever taught that. And it's a caricature and a straw man that is unfortunately put out even by Orthodox people. Why would we say that about the saints? The saints are not that obtuse. That's ridiculous. Of course, we recognize a whole variety of people outside the church. That doesn't impact, however, ecclesiology, which is the dogma of the church and the person of Christ, right? Which is always full. There's only fullness. It's Christ and the church is always full. And that pleroma is only in the church and of the church. That is not, that's a different matter from what, how we estimate and what we, what we, uh, what kind of estimation or, uh, or, or, or um, what's the word I want? The respect we might have for a whole variety and a whole spectrum of experiences and distance or, 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 or closeness to the faith of the church. That's a different question. That's a pastoral question. That's a question of how far one is from embracing the fullness of the church. That's a question of how we catechize. It's a question of, uh, of a variety of things is not Im immediately um, pertinent or impacting our understanding of the body of Christ as the dogma, the dogma of the church, right? So these these things are misunderstood. So when we say there's no mystery and no marriage outside the church, doesn't mean we simply say it's all blackness. That's nonsense. And that's a uh, so these two two things can coexist. But anyway, it's another topic. Let's keep going. Um. Daniel says it may be good to read a fearful story from page 340 about a man who thought he could sin and confess later. Um, probably not. Any, these questions need to be answered. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer all these questions. It's a good idea, but we'll see if we have time. Father, could you explain Leviticus 19.20? No, not right now. What about the importance of lifetime confession? We're talking about St. Nicodemus. And we're talking about the exmulgatarian. We're not going to do exegesis of Leviticus. What about the importance of the lifetime confession? Yes, it's a good point. Uh, the tradition, in my experience, is that uh, when you're a, a catechumen, you're approaching baptism, you have a lifetime confession. That means everything that's gone before, you come to the priest and you confess. There is a prayer re read over you. Some people consider it to be a mystery of confession. Others say no. Others don't even read the prayer. Uh, my experience on Manathos was the prayer was read just like any other. And, um, you know, you might not call it the mystery of confession because the person's not initiated yet, but the prayer is given to God for all of that to be um, re remitted and, and forgiven in the baptismal waters. And that is a very important, both psychological and in terms of purification, self-knowledge. That's a very important practice that the church has maintained 
uh, so that everything is put on the table, everything is put away, and everything is basically drowned in the waters of baptism, and we, we emerge a new man. And it shows our disposition to not go back to all of that, to acknowledge it as departing from a God's will, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, some elders and some saints encourage lifetime confessions for people who were baptized as children, or people who, even after baptism, at some point in their life, they go back and they do again a lifetime confession to an elder. That might be something that an elder or a spiritual father might give to someone, depending on certain various, you know, various things going on in their life. They might think that this is something going to be very helpful. So it's interesting that it's not just before baptism. In some cases, you even see it after baptism, especially with people who grow up in the church. So it is a uh, an important uh, spiritual practice uh, as, as, as a part of preparation for baptism uh, for the catechumen. Okay, next question. What if I go to a monastery and the only spiritual father there doesn't seem very fit, appropriate, orthodox? What if he doesn't re resonate in my soul? Then move on. He doesn't resonate in your soul, move on. End of the question. Go find another one. Um, nobody's going to force you to take a spiritual father if you don't want to. Father Bless, does St. Nicodemus admonition about how one unconfessed sin mainly refer to a conscious refusal to confess as opposed to forgetting one? Yes. It's talking about a conscious refusal. That's my understanding. Obviously, if you forget and remember later, bring it to confession. If you're, you, you may be, you may go through a process where you're either ignorant of certain sins or you're, you're, you know, burying them out of shame, but not intentionally, but, you know, you're psychologically not able to go there and you then bring it later on, confess it. But I think he's talking about something that's consciously held back, uh, not something that's you're ignorant of and you, you don't remember. Uh, question from Barry, hypothetically speaking, if I wanted to join the Orthodox Church as an outsider, but every single priest in every single parish I go to tells me I'm unwelcome, what should I do? Well, that's not going to happen because somewhere along the line, somebody's going to welcome you into the church. So I just don't think, I think hypothetically speaking, it, it, it's pointless because it's not going to happen. God have mercy. If we've reached the point where priests are turning people away from the church, I don't know what to say. And we're definitely in the end times. Why and how that could be the case would be, uh, you know, terrible uh, on the part of the Orthodox. I don't think it would be the case. Keep keep going. Bless, why can some people discern the demonic falsehood behind certain teachings, like COVIDism or ecumenism, and others cannot discern it? How does this relate to our spiritual life? What must we do to protect ourselves from being deceived? Uh, spiritual discernment is a fruit of the spiritual life, obviously, and the degree of purification and humility and obedience, crucifixion of the will and the intellect. All of that is going to lead uh, to one having a greater discernment. Uh, discernment is something that's achieved over time, much a struggle. Elder St. Uh, Joseph Hesius talks about it as the virtue that's not given, like some virtues people almost are born with, let's say, they're, they're, they grow up with and they're very adept at, they're very patient, or they're very, um, uh, you know, choose your virtue. Discernment is something that has to be acquired over time and through experience. So if someone does not have discernment, it's either because they're not struggling they're not, they don't have enough experience and they're not gaining that experience because they're not struggling to, you know, go deeper. Um, and so they don't have the fruit of, uh, of the spiritual life, which leads someone to, to, to acquire that. But it is characteristic of the saints. It's characteristic of the great elders and the fathers who uh, were great strugglers. Uh, and their experience and their prayer uh, allowed them, gave them uh, great discernment of spirits right behind the words behind the images behind the actions there's the spirits the demonic spirits that are pushing people toward hell uh and and they discern those spirits sometimes they're very deceptive sometimes they appear as angels of light and the these great 
spiritual strugglers who've been purified and have no, they're not obstructed in their vision by their own will, corrupted will or distorted will, but they've been purified and they've been united to God. And then they see, as it were, from the heavenly perspective, they're giving insights by the spirit of God. They're, they're free to see properly, not with their own human bodily eyes, but with the spiritual eyes of the whole of the Holy Spirit of the, uh, of the Lord who, who grants them this, this vision, this, this, this um, insight into what's going on. So people come to them and they're able to discern this person, you know, sometimes even giving clairvoyance, this person's for monastic life, this person is to be a priest, this person is to marry so-and-so. You see these things at the great fruit of, of, of the great violence that they've done to the old man. You know, we, we, and I'm first of those, uh, I like to eat, you know, and drink my coffee. I like to eat my, you know, energy bars, whatever it is. I like to sleep uh, late sometimes. All of that translates into a lack of struggle and violence against the old man. I mean, there's a whole spectrum of this, right? From something more simple to something more grievous. But all of that is basically an, an obstacle to acquiring greater levels and depths of spiritual discernment. Uh, not that it's one-to-one, -one, like if you're a great ascetic, therefore you're going to have discernment automatically because it's not enough to do the external struggle. Obviously, it's good. the humility and the patience and the obedience is really the heart of, of the spiritual struggle. Um, not to confuse people, they go, oh, well, you know, he fasted you know, amazingly, therefore he should have great discernment. It doesn't go like that. It's not a mechanical or numerical one-to-one. -one. Uh, we're talking about the essence of the spiritual life, which is self-denial, humility, obedience to the spiritual father, etc. For someone looking to enter the church, when is it appropriate to confess? Do you need to become a catechumen or is it case by case? Yeah, you become a catechumen and then you go uh, on a regular basis to the spiritual father, begin to do the confession even before baptism, and you end up with a life confession before you're baptized. But you are you have to become a catechumen. That prayer's read over you and uh, you come under the spiritual guidance of a, of a spiritual father or priest. Uh, question, a lot of people nowadays draw distinctions between canons having to do with ecclesiastic regulations and canons having to do with penances. And such canons, sorry, I got a fly who doesn't want to leave me alone. And such canons having to do with penances uh, and such things. They, they will say that the penance-related canons are basically subjective and we don't have to pay much attention to them while on the contrary, the canons of ecclesiastical regulation must absolutely be followed. Is such a distinction and difference in approach patristic? Um, the, the penances or rules given in the canons of St. John the Faster for sexual sins and all the rest are definitely going to be applied case by case and they're going to be probably in our day oftentimes lessened uh, because we're just so poor spiritually. So that's that's definitely the case, right? We are going to have that. Um, that doesn't mean they're not applied. That doesn't mean this, that the same same uh, goal is not there. Uh, the The spirit is kept. The actual numbers or days uh, and all the rest are going to differ from person to person, spiritual father, spiritual father. But the this the the uh, what's not negotiable is the therapeutic program. You can't, you know. Famously, Abba Pimin says, when asked, "How long does it take for someone to be return to God and and repent and be restored?" And they ask a year, and he says, "No, a month, no, a week, no, a day, no." even in three hours or something, or an hour, I forget what he says. So the point there is that what's really important is the deep repentance, right? If he has deep, deep repentance, then God can restore him almost immediately. That's the end goal of all of the penances and all of the therapeutic program is to restoration to God in communion. If that's coming about, then the therapeutic program is being fulfilled in the essence of 
the canon is being fulfilled and the penances, the numbers might differ, but the end is the same. Now, we could make a real mockery of that and still think we're restored. Of course, there's a possibility of that. We could we could dumb it down, let's say, so much that it's a it's a shell of what it was. It's a joke. We don't really have true repentance, you know. And there's even many spiritual fathers who simply won't even bother to even give any kind of canon uh, or rule. So you go to confession for something that might keep you. The canons might keep say you're not to commune for. 40 days or three months. And yet the spiritual father will say you can commune tomorrow or on Sunday. And that happens, you know, that I'm not going to, I can't judge whether that was a good decision in each particular case, but if that's a systematic approach and everybody who comes to you, comes to me as a spiritual father, everyone comes to me uh, for that particular sin, I have the same answer, right? Okay. Commune Sunday, commune Sunday. Commune. There's something wrong, right? We're not doing the therapeutic program. We've abandoned the, the, the spirit of the canon. We've abandoned the approach of the fathers. Uh, there has to be some program for each of us. It might differ. It will differ. Uh, but that's going to remain. All right. So um, you don't just cease paying attention. You say we don't have to pay attention to them. That's not true. Uh, the spiritual fathers should definitely pay attention to them and apply with wisdom and discernment in each case appropriately there may be cases where you where someone will not commune for a year or two or three why why is that out that's not outside the realm of possibility god forbid if we're going to just automatically say strike that from the canon strike that from the pedalion I, that's undiscerning right that's not a discerning approach there can't be those kind of limits put e in either direction the discernment of the spiritual father has to be paramount but he has to be humble and, and understand that there's going to be a therapeutic program. It might not be a year or three months or whatever from Holy Communion, but it will be something else. Uh, there'll be Jesus prayer. There'll be prostrations. There'll be fasting. There'll be something in which the, the will and the life is formed and trained according to the will of God, in which we change our ways. We change our habits. We don't go back to the old man and the old ways and habits. That's got to be some, There's got to be something applied to to reach that goal i think the people saying that paisios oftentimes revel in the ecclesiastical uh you know uh laws for you know division of power or administrative issues and they just love to be able to say well in this case you know this church or that church can't do xyz or this is the way things are ordered and this means that the patriarch of this church is first you know, for me, I'm sorry, but that seems very hypocritical. If we're going to be super double down, uh, crivia, 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 you know, exactitude uh, of the canons where it's in our best interest in our, you know, for our authority, but then we're going to brush off what it, what's necessary for somebody to be healed and not go back to sin. Well, God forbid, God help us. I mean, if that's the case, God help us. Another question, what's the first step of entering into the monastic life? Go visit a monastery. Speak to the spiritual father. Spend time and see. I mean, that's certainly one major step, right? Obviously, before that, you're, I'm assuming you have a spiritual father. I'm assuming that you're living the life in the parish for a considerable amount of time and you're applying. Maybe not. I'm not saying you have to be in the parish for a long time, but a lot of people will be until they start to learn spiritual life in depth so they can actually live out the spiritual life in the monastery assuming the monastery is a monastery that's healthy a monastery that's got a you know a healthy uh struggle and a crivia that's being applied uh but you're gonna have to visit many monasteries you're gonna have to be guided by spiritual father in that whole process uh, of course you're gonna have to be living out the life of the church and then the monastery is going to make sense. There are exceptions to that rule, but that's the that's the normal process, I think. Father, I'm a convert and was married twice before my conversion. Does the penance rule apply to me, or does the church not recognize my previous marriages now that I'm Orthodox? We've already answered that, Marvin, a little bit earlier. Does not apply. There's only mysteries in the church. Mar marriages outside the church are not the mysteries of the church. They're not they're not blessed by God. You're not united in Christ. You don't have Christ as the common center meaning the church the mysteries that's what we mean when we say christ is the center the mystery of the eucharist that's not happening outside the church 
All of that is the context for the mysteries. You, there's, there's, of course, people who are given in marriages in those contexts, even in the civil marriages and heterodox marriages and all of that. We can talk about what that means. We cannot say it means the mystery, the sacrament, the un unity in Christ in the church, obviously. I mean, is that kind of obvious? They're, they're, not, they're not the church, right? They're not experiencing the church. They're not even claiming to be the church. So I think it's, it should be obvious to all of us that we, they're not comparable. What, what the mystery of the church and the mystery of the marriage and the church is and what the mystery or the sacrament or whatever they're, they're calling it outside the church is can't be the same thing. We're not doing the same thing. There are two different presuppositions that they're not met, right, when they're outside the church, the, the presuppositions that... Uh, uh, exist in the church. So you sh it, the akrivia and the exactitude that the saints uh, would teach and have taught, like Elder Ephraim, is that when you're baptized, you're chrismated, you commune, and then you're married. If you're married uh, as a heterodox and you come to the church with your wife and you both become orthodox, immediately you should be married at the on the day of, if not, you know, certainly the, the day of is the best, but the next day or the next week, in a, very soon after, you should be married in the church. That's the exactitude. That's the akrivia. Now, there's a lot of talk about what the economy is, and there's a lot of practices in America which I've never heard any explanation for. Like, there are jurisdictions which never do any marriages or don't want to even. They don't like the idea that you have to be married in church. And I, I don't understand their theology. I don't understand on what basis they're teaching this. I don't see patristic basis for it. There's theories of, well... Uh, in the 8th century or the 6th century is only when marriage really started. Blah, blah. And there's all kinds of academic theories. I could care less about the academic theories. Why? Because that's not how the church works. We don't follow academics in, the, in, in academia. There's no magisterium of academic theologians in the Orthodox Church. Whatever they found out in the 8th century is irrelevant. It's, almost, it's very, very minor in the grand scheme of things. The question is, what the church has lived and lives today and has lived for centuries and understood and what the saints teach. That's what we should be concerned about. And in this case of how do people enter the church? Should they be baptized, chrismated, commune, and married? Certainly if you do that, there's no doubts anymore, right? Everything's going to be very clear. It's a win-win for everybody. I don't understand why people don't want to go that route. It's kind of a mystery to me. Next question. Is it not more correct to understand marriage outside the church as a rather legal contract, regardless of the quality of the relationship within it, but not properly labeled a marriage? I just said exactly that, Mary. Thank you very much. Next, Father Bless, is there a danger for laymen going to confession too often? Do you think going too often then what's necessary can make someone become numb or indifferent to it? Yes, there's always a possibility that, that um, you can commune five times a week. You know, you could fast every day. You could fulfill all the presuppositions, right? And you could commune every day. You may have that spiritual state. You may have that ascetic life, and you may be greatly benefited. You also may not be approaching with the requisite fear and, 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 and spiritual preparation, and therefore you're not. it's not going to be under salvation. So this is where the discernment of the spiritual father plays a big role. Your own self-knowledge. Uh, and, and so going to confession, you know, every week could be wonderful, might not be. Depends on you, your state. These things, again, you can't answer generally. You got to look at, you got to be a spiritual father and look with the sermon upon each soul that's coming to you. Uh, I would say this, the practice is, of course, well known in Russia, every, in many places anyway, every communion, a confession. In Greece, for the most part, all throughout the Mediterranean world, uh, that's not the case. We don't have it tied one to one. You have to go to confession for every communion. Uh, many places you'll com you'll confess once a month or once every two or even three months. Uh, in northern Greece, where a lot of people have spiritual fathers in Mount Athos, they would com they would confess one every three three months. Maybe the elder would come off or the spiritual father would come off Holy Mountain to see his spiritual children in Thessaloniki. Maybe four times a year, five times a year. It's hard to say. It really depended. So there has never been this idea in the Orthodox world in, you know, former, former lands of the Roman Empire slash Greek Orthodoxy. I don't like that term Greek Orthodoxy because it doesn't, it's not really descriptive of what I want to say. I want to say the whole Middle East, 
North Africa, all of the orthodoxy of the, let's say, the ancient patriarchates, I don't think they have this, this approach to confession. In fact, I was shocked one of the first times I went to my spiritual father, Amanathos, for confession. It was I went Saturday thinking I would confess on Saturday like I always did in America, and then I would commune on Sunday. And he said to me, I can't get to you today. Come after com communion tomorrow to confess. You know, I was kind of like, can I commune? Because that's how I had been conditioned. Does not enter the mind, apparently, of a lot of Athenites and others that that's a one-to-one. -one. Like, you know, if you have some sin that you prevents you, okay, yeah. But obviously in, in that regular, let's say, confession that's going on every few, you know, few months um, or, or every month, um, we're struggling with sins that do not necessarily and should not, uh, you know, prevent us from communing. You know, I didn't do my rule last night. I, I ate, you know, something with oil. These are not really sins that are preventing you to commune. You should go to confession, write them down, repent of them, immediately repent. Whether you confess tomorrow or in a, in a month, can, can immediately repent of that. You know, maybe even do a few prostrations, say the Jesus prayer, stand before the icon, seek seek forgiveness, write it down in your little book that you're going to take the confession in a month. All of that immediately. Whether you confess in a week or a month, these things are not obstacles to communion, at least in my experience, in my spiritual father, uh, I never heard such thing. So you, you see that, um, hopefully I answered your question about, you know, the question of, be, let's say, becoming too used to it, not preparing properly, it becoming rote. I think that's what you're getting at. That, that can happen. That can happen. Is there a danger of a layman going to confession? Oh, you just said that. Okay. If look at the Pater Petre, if there is no access to a confessor, spiritual father, can I do a confession over the phone? Katikonomia? Yes. According to the economy, today, increasingly, due to the great distances people are separated from the spiritual father, this happens. It's not normal. It's not the akrivia. It's not the exactitude. It's not ideal. But because there's really oftentimes no practical way around it, then it's done. And prayers are read from a distance and there's no implicit spiritual obstacle. It's just not preferred. It's much preferred to be in person. But these are the things we deal with today. These massive distances in the West, especially in few spiritual fathers. Question, do Roman Catholic or Protestant exorcism work? And what are the differences compared to Orthodox exorcisms? Well, whether or not God will do something among the heterodox here or there, I cannot say. Whether these are exorcisms of the church, by the church, uh, and therefore I can identify with them and claim that they are properly understood as exorcisms, no, I cannot do that. I cannot embrace them and I cannot identify them. I cannot equate them to the prayers of the church in un under no circumstances. Can I say that this is the church working and these are ministers of the church working and the, therefore it is an exorcism like the exorcism read by the church and by the spiritual fathers. I, on the other hand, cannot say God will do nothing and never has. That's God can do whatever he wants, but it certainly is not something he's shown us that he's, that he's, a, he's doing it and equate, he's showing us that we should equate it with the exorcism of the church. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully you can see the distinction. As far as what are the differences, I, I've never read what they read. I don't know their prayers. I haven't studied what, like, for instance, a, a, a papal or a Latin priest would read. I, I I don't know. I can't answer practically, you know, on the mechanics of it. I don't know. Uh, if you're interested in joining the Orthodox, but there's no church around, did we already answer this question? I think we did. Uh, how can I go about joining the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church if there are only Protestant and quote unquote Catholic churches around me? So I would uh, I would reach out to someone, a priest, if you you know somebody you've seen or met or even online, 
and I would start to talk to them about what's available to me in my area. I would eventually make a trip to a nearby priest or monastery and establish a relationship, even if it means I'm only going there once in a blue moon. But there needs to be some personal contact on some level, even if it's very sparse because of the distances. That's how we, 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 the incarnation and the church is in time and space. We have to have a connection to the apostles and their successors and their disciples today. And so I don't think it's a, it's a non-negotiable. Of course, much can be done from a distance. We can read and, and study like we're doing tonight. Uh, you can read the books. You can go. You can make progress. You can start to pray. You can start to, you know, read the lives of the saints. There's tons of things you can do uh, today by God's providence with technology to go deeper into the mind and to start apply practical things in your life, uh, even if you never set foot in or or only set foot in Orthodox Church once a year, for instance, worst case scenario, let's say at least once a year. Um, but you, you know, so that can happen and you can go deeper and you can make progress. You can prepare yourself to a certain degree, but you still need to have a spiritual guide, father, priest, bishop, monk, somebody who's guiding you. And then you're going to cut, you're going to come into contact with them and you're eventually going to be baptized. You know, you're going to have extras and prayers read, catechumen and prayers read. You're going to have all those things read over you and you're going to be baptized, chrismated, communed, married, if you need to be, uh, even if it means you're only going to church once a year, that's still got to happen if we're going to be connected to the church. I don't think there's any way around it. Like, I don't think we can become a cyber church. It's not possible. We're not like Protestants. We actually have communion. Oil is put over us when we're chrismated. We're baptized three times in the water. We, you know, we, we partake in the unction services. These are physical things for our body because we're body and soul and the whole man needs to be saved. We cannot simply dismiss that. It has to happen at some level, at some point. Hello, Father. Thank you for this wonderful book. Do you think this book could help priests develop a better practice of approaching confession? Absolutely. That's why it was written. I think the main reason it was written was for the priest and also for the, I mean, both and, right? Both and. But it, it's obviously extremely valuable for the priest. So, yes, absolutely. And I hope that it does. I hope that it does. I hope every priest buys it. I hope every priest reads it. I know I need to reread it. I read it years ago. I need to go back and reread it. It's absolutely essential. Um, I was blown away by some of the stuff that I read today in preparation for this talk. I'd forgotten. It's extremely valuable. I can't, I, I can't underestimate it. For us today, even if, again, we're not going to apply everything as is, and we probably won't. But we've got to get the mind. We've got to get the standard. We've got to have that in mind. We've got to we've got to enter into the spirit. And you can't do that if you just blow off the canons and the fathers. It's not possible. It's it's, it's impious. Next question: Is that uh, question, Father? Is it not true that when I repent and receive the sacred gift and turn back to sin, no chance I can get back to Jesus? No, it is not true. You're saying if you commune, you're, you're, you're an Orthodox Christian. You, as I understand you, your question, you commune, you fall back into sin. Are you lost and there's no hope for you? Absolutely not. Not true. You absolutely have repentance. That's what the whole confession is for. That's what the mystery is for. That's what the Lord has taught us and given us in the body of Christ. People are th But you've got to come back sincerely, not mocking not 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 thinking I'll sin I'll go to confession and I'll go sin all of those approaches are duplicitous and undermining and all you're doing is mocking and and you know it's it's very dangerous so you've got to come with all humility and all um, fear of God to the mystery and with the grace of God you will not go back to the vomit all right I think I'm to the end of the questions Justin if I'm not let me know let me see did we We've got uh, 10 questions over at Crowdcast. Let's see what those are. Bless Father, I have read in St. Paisu's books, but also heard from St. Father Cosmas that an effort struggle has to be done by the one communing. And that this is a serious matter. Of course it is. You just don't confess your sins and that's it. Of course. Because I don't feel worthy in the sense that I don't feel I struggle. I'm I'm infected by sloth. 
I feel really unworthy to take communion and don't. I once was, I was once explaining that I don't want to take communion without a serious effort on my part. I was told that when people got to communion, that's enough effort. It sounds a bit strange to me, but to be honest, but what do you think? Okay, you should not be deciding when you commune. Your spiritual father should guide you in that. You need to go with him, go to him and bring everything you just said to me and much more. You need to lay it all out. You need to say, I, I don't feel worthy. I don't feel this. I don't feel that. Whatever you feel. And then he's going to tell you what you need to do. And if he's the discerning spiritual father, he's going to find the middle path, the royal path, rather. He's going to find that where he's going to get you to go. To, you need to struggle. Absolutely. He's going to allow, have that as a part of your spiritual program. You're going to have to do X, Y, Z before you go to communion. But it's going to be within reach and you can do it. And then you're going to go to communion. You're not this whole idea that I'm not I'm not worthy I'm not worthy I'm not worthy I'm not going to commune that's a trap. Nine times out of ten that's a trap, unless you have some serious sins. Obviously that's a different issue. But if you're just saying, look, I don't feel like I'm struggling enough, and therefore I'm never going to commune, that's probably a trap. You need to struggle a little bit more than what you can do. You need to go to the next level wherever that is, and then you make progress. And then the next time, the next step. It's called step by step by step. Start where you are. Make that ascetic struggle, whatever it is. There are people who do 10 prostrations and only 300 knot uh, prayer rope or 100 knot prayer rope or five prostrations. It doesn't matter. Everybody's a different stage. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But that's where you are. That's where you start. And then you go and you keep faithful to that. And that whatever that is, even if it's a weak struggle, that's the struggle. And then if you're faithful to that, you commune. That's my understanding. But then you're going to go the next step. You're going to go, okay, this month I did not, it's not a numbers game, but it's a question of determination and upping the disposition and determination, making it stronger, right? Making your, it's like, it's like the weightlifting, right? You don't start with a thousand pounds. You start with whatever you can start with. What is it? 50 pounds. And you do that every day, every day, every day, every day until you get to the next level. Again, it's not a numbers thing. It's a question of disposition and love. But it's oftentimes seen, reflected in the degrees, the numbers. Of course, that's not doesn't go on forever, right? <laughs> the saints who are super struggle, strugglers don't do you know thousands upon thousands of prostrations or something. It doesn't just keep going higher. No, you get to a point where you have a basic rule you keep. And then you go, you know, you go deeper uh, essentially, spiritually. But for beginners, it's gonna it's gonna be reflected a bit in the numbers, not a whole lot, but a bit. Father, I've read Saint Nicodemus' homily at the end of the Exmulgatari, and I was quite shocked, and it made me depressed, as I don't think I will ever feel that deep of pain in my heart for my sins. But you're you're relying too much on yourself, Nicodemus. Repentance itself is a gift God gives us. We're just a bunch of zeros. All our efforts are zeros. He's the one. He gives us all the contrition. He gives us the tears. He gives us, you know, we struggle as much as we can. And then, then when he deems it beneficial, he gives us that respite, the, that consolation. He, he comes and he encourages us. So I think you're, you're focusing too much on what you, you know, you're feeling or you're or you're not struggling enough and you focus on you, you, you. Yeah, okay, if that's if you're waiting for you to become some great ascetic, it'll never happen. What you need to do is say, what am I, where am I? Next step, God help me, right? God help me to get to the next step. To me, a metanya, a repentance from the heart seems like an impossible thing. I don't, I think you think that, but it's not impossible because everything's possible with God. You need to rely more on God. What easy thing can we do to feel more and more hurt deeply inside when we have sinned and experienced more and more of a proper repentance and not stagnate at a legalistic confession? Okay, I, I think I've answered the question. You need to start right where you are, go to the next step, and, and cry out to God to give you what you're asking for. He will give it to you. With him, it is possible. But you've got to come humbly and obediently and trust in God that he will give it to you. Instead of thinking, I can't. Of course you can't. Who can? Nobody can. None of us can. Father bless, what is the role of the spiritual father with respect to catechumens? He guides them like he would a spiritual son in the church. 
Same thing. How does confession work? Since the sacrament can only be given to those. So essentially everything is done just like in the church, just like uh, after baptism, rather. Everything is done. And the prayer is read in my, and, and this is in the, my experience on Athos and among uh, the monasteries of America. Okay, so maybe there's different practices. I don't know. Other places, they don't do this. But the same thing is done, and the prayer is read, and, and it's offered up to God. We don't call it a formal confession, a mystery of confession. But ba basically, the catechumen is being prepared and already doing what he should be doing and will be doing right after baptism. That's key. You're not going to wait till you get the baptism to start living the life. You've got to live it all. Everything but the, the mysteries, everything as if you're a in the church already. You're going to prayer rule, the daily services. You're going to fast with the church. You're going to pray with the church, right? And then you're going to be in a position to receive the grace at baptism. And then all of that's going to be like come down as a blessing upon everything you've done as a catechumen. So it's my experience. It's, it's, it's essentially the same uh, minus the title and, you know, seal of, the mystery of confession, but the prayers are offered and God hears the prayers of the priest for the sake of the repentance. I mean, it's, and it's, you know, if you want, you can say it's all washed away in baptism. All of those confessions are washed away in baptism. If you like, that's, that's why we can think of that. Father bless in one of the footnotes about the sin of self abuse. I remember the saints speaking of some bodily symptoms that arise when someone falls into it. A few were anxiety, even vision problems. And then it came across this psalmic verse. For evils without number have encompassed me. My iniquities took hold of me, and I became unable to see. Yes. Thank you, Matthew. Very interesting. I don't know what to say about the psalm. If we can apply it right to the words of the of the saint, it certainly could be. Uh, unable to see spiritually, that's for sure. Uh, whether there's actual visible uh, physical problems with vision, I don't know if that's always the case. It, it's, like, it's like any other disease. It may be the case for you, right? When you read, you know, you have these... You know, you have this the sickness and the symptoms may be X, Y, Z. I think that's how we should understand what the saint's saying. And he's saying this is what could happen and it does happen if there's a prolonged slavery to this sin. And over time, the body also is affected and, and, and has ailments. Uh, and I think that was very eye-opening because it makes perfect sense that we're body and soul together. It's all going to be affected, not just the soul, but also the body. So I think, yeah. Could be the fake could be the uh, the case of what you're saying father can you talk about the beatitudes i can carla but not tonight we're not talking about the beatitudes tonight. we're talking about saint nicodemus another time maybe another maybe we'll talk all about them in one talk in the future lydia where are the apostolic constitutions this is the same thing as the canons there there's a text attributed to the disciples the, the, the apostles and their disciples circulated from, I think, the end of the, the beginning of the second century, I think is, is what it's dated to. I don't know a lot of details about the, um, you know, the uh, historical details around the constitutions. Uh, it's akin to the apostolic canons, uh, and it's very respected as an authoritative text representing the apostolic teachings. So um, go online and read it. It's online. It's easily accessible. Another question from... Nectarios. Nectarios, you got too many questions. I got to go to somebody else. Lydia, 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 Irene. Let's see, Irene. Father, what if we were not given penances for sins mentioned in these canons? Can we be punished by God due to this? I had four miscarriages in a row and was not given a penance. My health is very bad, and I wonder if my health is a result of my sins and the lack of penance in my life for my confessed sins. This question has to go to a confessor in the confessional. I can't answer this for you. By the illumination of God, a spiritual father, an elder, somebody who has a lot of experience in healing people needs to answer this question for you, Irene. Um, it may be the case. I don't know. I can't speak to it. I don't know all the details. Uh, I Again, it's, it, there has to be some therapeutic application. When there's zero, nothing, no reference, no anything, then to me, it's a question, big question mark. I don't know the answer in every case, but I think that your question here is kind of pointing to, well, shouldn't I have received something? Shouldn't there have been some therapeutic, uh, you know, acknowledgement? Maybe it would have been very simple, very simple. I don't know. And that's up to the spiritual father. I can't say that the spiritual father has to do exactly what the canon says. No, he doesn't. But there has to be something. 
We can't just ignore it. That's my point tonight, is that St. Nicodemus is telling us whether we apply the exact canon, we've got a, the spirit of the canon, and the and the, the end goal of therapy has to be uh, there for us, or, or what are we doing? Like, you can't just be a doctor and ignore all the symptoms and all, all the, all the ther therapy, right? It's not a magical, it's not magical. If, if, we, if we ignore the, the, the need for us to carry out a therapeutic rule, it, it does seem to imply that our conception of the mystery is somewhat magical, right? There's a synergy, folks. God gives, but we have to come to it. We have to bring our own repentance and struggle to it. That's what's going on. That's what this, these, these, this discussion of penance is all about. What do we bring that's going to then combine with the grace of God and his mercy and therefore affect the healing of the soul? So when you say there's nothing at all, because nobody considered this as something in need of therapy, then I have a big question mark. But you got to go to a spiritual father and sit down with him and answer those questions and experience spiritual father. Father bless, Father Felipe used to always say, where are we? Um, don't be weird. <laughs> if we followed the outline of the lifestyle this book sounds like it describes, we'd be weird. How do we rectify this? Not all of us can go live in a monastery tucked away from the world. Where it expected that they are weird, Where's where it's expected that they are weird, just saying not worldly. Hmm. Our Orthodox world today is so far from this kind of orthodoxy. Well, I don't know. We have to talk more specifics. You're very general. I don't know what you have in mind. I don't know what Father has in mind. Which part? Maybe if you gave me some examples, I'd be able to give you a better answer how to apply this. Uh, again, I, 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 I'm going to say it for like the 15th time, and it's really necessary, and I won't tire in it. The spirit, the mind, absolutely. The actual application has to be done by a spiritual father. And so um, there, it depends. Like it may be in your case, if the spiritual father said you had to do X, you would be weird. But if in another person's case, it wouldn't be. You know, I, we cannot say that across the board, right? That it's always the case. If you're in a village in Greece, it won't be as weird as if you're in LA and, you know, what? Uh, I get that, right? So there has to be a discerning application uh, case by case. Um, you know, the, the head covering for women, for instance. I know women who are who desire and get the blessing from the spiritual father to wear the head covering always. And other people who say, that's crazy, I'm going to be like a Muslim. And they shouldn't do it if they're not prepared to that for that kind of weirdness, as you say, right? But is it always condemned because they're wearing a head covering? I don't think so. I don't think we can do that. We can't condemn it across the board. God have mercy. They're trying to fulfill the words of the Apostle Paul and the teachings of St. John Chrysostom. If, if other people do it who are not understanding, prepared, they're in a position, a circumstance in their family, it would be really problematic. There would be a lot of dissent, discussion, whatever. And it would really not, it's not there yet. Like there has to, it has to mature, right? That's a, a wise spiritual father would say, don't wear the head covering all day long. It's not a good idea for you, even though it's blessed, theoretically. Others, it is blessed in their circumstances, in their household, with their husband and their children and their work. It's all blessed. So, again, you cannot apply these things indiscriminately across the board. But the spirit, the mind, we need to acquire. Does that make sense? Lydia asks, is it always a spiritual father or is there such thing as a spiritual mother like a nun? There are spiritual mothers in the church. There are spiritual mothers and even spiritual fathers like Elder Paisios, St. Paisios the Athenite, who was not a priest. He didn't give confession, of course. He didn't give, he didn't, he wasn't able to do confession with the people. He was not a priest. So if you go to a monk or a nun and they guide you in many ways, you still have to go to a spiritual father to get confession. They might work together in tandem with the abbess or abbot or monk or whoever it might be. But I'd be very surprised if that abbess, abbot or monk didn't tell you 
go to that spiritual father for confession as well as come to me and that they would agree that that would be a blessed arrangement out of respect for the spiritual father. You can't get around it. You got to go to confession and the priest is going to be the one confessing you. Both and. Cindy Morgan asks, what will be added in the newest version of this book that will come out? Okay, well, the book's already out. The new version's out. There's no additions in this book. But you you heard wrongly. You thought I was talking about Ex Mulligatarian. I'm talking about Confession of Faith. The third volume will have new material added by the saint, about the saint. Uh, it'll be an ex God willing, right? We're working on it right now. We're trying to get it done. We want to bring it out by the end of September. We're up against a deadline right now. But that will be Confession of Faith, the third volume uh, in the series, not the Exomogatarian. Exomogatarian is out and about. It's not going to be changed or added to. Joachim has a question. Uh, just want to make sure we're not getting cut off on any of our streams. I think we're okay. Father, I want to mention that when I just became... An Orthodox, I read parts of the Apostolic Canon, and it protected me so much from the ecumenist influence I encountered when I was away in college for four years. Listening to the Romanian saints on YouTube also helped me against ecumenism. I have experienced that we have the Holy Gospel in the church, but we also have ecumenists teaching the vomit that contradict the church teachings. I believe those are other and fake gospels. Am I thinking okay here, Father? Thank you. Um, the, the teaching, the hard sayings that, that you're talking about in the apostolic canons, the apostolic constitutions, or say Nicodemus, or the, or the canons, those hard sayings are super helpful for the humble spirit, the humble mind, who understands the spirit and understands the boundaries. It doesn't get legalistically taken away, but takes it to a spiritual father and, and acquires the mind and learns step by step to become discerning and how to apply those things today. Uh, absolutely, we live in a very different time than the first century or the fifth century or even the 18th century. So we need a discerning application. That doesn't mean these things are not necessary. We must sit at the feet of the fathers of all the days and assimilate their teachings and apply them in our life. So absolutely, you're absolutely right that these things help us tremendously. I know the Roma Romanian saints many times come down as hard on us. Saint Elder Cleopa was off is very stark sometimes we have a video online right now put up a couple weeks ago where he says you know death 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 he says many times we have to remember death i mean you know that's hard to hear for this for the pampered death fearing uh majority of people in our day and age but we need to hear it we need to be humbled we need to apply it to our life discerningly i understand there are people out there who aren't going to apply it discerningly that's a shame but it, it, we can't do anything about it folks we can't avoid it because some people are going to make a mess of it. That doesn't make any sense. No, we need to help them not make a mess of it, right? So we need to double down on the right understanding of these things, not avoid discussing them because they're taboo or something. That's ridiculous. Irene has a question. Someone said that the catechumens were traditionally instructed after the dismissal of the catechumen during liturgy. This doesn't make sense to me because it would require meaning Someone to misliturgize to catechize, the liturgy to catechize. I could not find anything on this historically, but maybe my instincts are wrong. Do we know when catechumens were traditionally catechized? Um, I think it depended on the time period of the church. You're going to have different answers to that. I don't think there's one answer. But in the ancient church, uh, they were definitely dismissed. They were definitely dismissed after the gospel. And the when the prayer was read, the catechumens departed. Whether they were catechized by a catechist right then, I tend to think that that did happen. I don't have any historical proof of that. I think it should and could happen today. And I don't think it's problematic for somebody to go and catechize them. But today we have technology. We don't need to have somebody leave. They could do it through a you know a lecture series and read a book. Uh, um, even so, if a church is is sufficiently supplied with several catechists, they could take they could take turns, and one could do it one Sunday Sunday and the next another Sunday not the end of the world. It all depends on the practical circumstances of the parish uh, and, the, and you know, what's blessed, what's possible. Some parishes can do it, some can't. But I think it's a good thing. If they, if they depart and they're catechized with whatever means, I think it's a good thing. 
it'll be very good for them at the end of the day when they finally, for the first time, enter the full divine liturgy and commune. Believe me, they're going to be grateful that they were outside for a year or two or however long it takes them. Can you define the sins that you haven't confessed that keep you from communing? What does that mean? Sins that you have? Oh, I see. The severity of the sins. Well, look, if you're consciously not confessing sins, you should not go to communion. If you're saying, I don't want to confess that sin, I'm not going to tell my priest, and you go to communion, not a good idea. You need to go confess that sin. Or get a blessing to go to somebody else or do something. But you cannot, you cannot consciously avoid a sin that's bothering your conscience. And maybe it's not a mortal sin. Maybe you didn't fornicate or adulterer or something like that. Okay. But something that's bothering your conscience and you're consciously not telling the priest, not tell, not confessing to God, that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. The, the best thing is to go and confess it and receive whatever penance he's going to give and not be shamed. Shame before confession is not of God. Shame, in other words, prevent you from confession is what I mean, right? That's what the devil is saying. Don't, don't, it's, you know, he's encouraging you to be shame, have shame and not confess. The shame should happen when the sin is at stake. The devil is encouraging you then. He's telling you to commit the sin. That's when you should have shame. When you commit a sin, you should no longer have shame to the point of not confessing, but kill that false shame and confess the sin and not fear uh, anything but God uh, and, and, and the punishment of not confessing, right? All right. Um, got two long... Let me see what we got over there. We've got Lydia and Nectarios with two long ones. Let's see if we got other questions here. Uh, question. Let's see if I can get there. Before one finds his spiritual father, how does one develop spiritual life? Prayer rule, fasting, increasing in virtues. So far, I've been mostly going it alone. Um, I would seek guidance from the church fathers, the saints, uh, immediately and try to follow the saints' examples in a very humble and simple way and not apply any big numbers to myself. But I don't see why you can't find somebody as soon as possible to get some guidance, right? Go visit a monastery. Go visit a parish. Start the process of the catechumenate. Um, I think that's the wisest way to do it. Now, if you just simply can't for whatever reason, which I can't imagine, then you can, with much, I would say, humility and with, with uh, uh, you know, some hesitance and reticence, try to do some really basic things that you see in the lives of the saints. But basic, like if they're doing the Jesus prayer, you know, you do 33 or 100 or something, but not say, oh, he does 3,000, I'll do 3,000. That, that kind of not, that would not be blessed, right? Or if you're fast, if you want to fast, like the saints fast, well, they, they fast on Mondays. Yeah, let's do that too. No, that's not for you. Uh, whatever, you understand what I'm saying. You've got you've to gotta really be careful. You want to be obedient, and you want to be obedient to Christ in the church, and, that's, that's, and the catechumen is the beginning of in earnest of your life in the church. So the best thing is to find a spiritual father, go visit a monastery, and, and, and figure a way to begin the catechumen. Or call up a priest or something. I don't know. Call up a priest or write a priest online or somebody or something. Get some direction. That's really important. Do you have any other books coming out soon from Jacob? Thank you, Jacob. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And let me see if I have the image here to share with you. I don't think I do, actually. Um, but maybe I can um, find it. We have a book coming out. It's called The Orthodox Patristic Witness. Concerning Catholicism. And we also have another book coming out, The F Rise and Fall of the Papacy. And um, let me see if I can share that with you. Hmm. I'm not really sure if I can do that. I'll try briefly. 
to do that. Um, all right, let's see if we can do this. Hang on a second. Window. All right. So, um, these, do you see these books here? The first one is Concerning Frequent Communion, which is coming out in two weeks, right there at the top. The next one is The Orthodox Patristic Witness Concerning Catholicism, an Orthodox ethos publication coming out soon. And The Rise and Fall of the Papacy, Patrick Craig Trulia. That's what we're looking at in terms of books coming out from Orthodox Ethos, Uncle Mountain Press. All right. There we go. Let me see what we got. How does one end their relationship with their spiritual father if necessary? You get a blessing and you get you go find another spiritual father. You get his blessing to come to him. And you go back to your spiritual father and ask for a blessing to depart and go to the other spiritual father. You get a blessing before you leave. That's the ideal. That's the norm. Unless the spiritual father has departed into heresy or delusion or been defrocked or suspended or anything like that where his, he can no longer serve as a spiritual father, then you don't need a blessing. How does one end their relationship with, let's see, in what way is the husband a spiritual leader in the home? And how does this work alongside a spiritual father? Spiritual, uh, this is a big question. I can't really get into too much deep here, but uh, too deep here. But um, the, the husband is going to be a spiritual leader in the home, as laid out by many, many examples especially this book. I would really recommend this book if you don't have it. Um, Orthodox Christian Parenting. You see that right there? It's a massive, wonderful tome from Zoe Press. Orthodox Christian Parenting, Recipes for Raising Children. And in here, there's going to be tons of material, practical guidance from the fathers and the saints about how to be a father, a mother, a parent, Right? Um, before marriage, spiritual fathers, ethical decisions affecting the family, a new life, your prayer for home, large families, fatherhood, raising boys, a holy role, being a spiritual leader. All right here. Look at that. See that? Let's see if we can get that on the screen. I don't know. It's too, it's too, uh, it's too uh, dark. It's too light. Anyway, uh, a whole uh, uh, 20 pages or so in that book, I recommend it. But you know, he's going to be guided by the spiritual father. He's going to have examples of the saints and the and the holy men in his life. And he's going to imitate them and be a kind of spiritual father after the spiritual father. And being an example of prayer, mainly an example, first and foremost, and then teaching and guiding and praying and guiding people in prayer. And, and, uh, and the spiritual, he's going to be obedient to the spiritual father along with his wife. But he's going he's gonna to be charged by the spiritual father, by the church, to, to raise that child in the fear of God. The parents are the first example, and they will give an account. If they properly reflected God as a father and guided him to Christ, then they have a great reward for that role they played. If not, then they're going to, those are issues. We've got to be really careful what we're doing as fathers and mothers. We have a great responsibility. Uh, but that's a big question. Hopefully you'll find in this book answers. I really recommend it. Father, as far as death, what would you have us say to our children? It feels very wrong to lie to them, but I hate to scare them with the idea of death at such a young age. The whole idea that you're going to scare them with death is the problem. We're Christians. Death is no longer. It's a doorway. It's no longer the end. There's nothing scary about death. That's the problem. You've got to get over that yourself. You've got to put that behind you. You've got to run from the society that tells you that death is scary. It doesn't scary about death. The death of the saints is precious in the eyes of the Lord. Right? The de death is our quintessential moment of life. It's the moment where it shows forth what, what, what kind of life we led. We look forward to the death of the body because it's going to enter, we're going to enter into the kingdom of God. 
We're going to be with Christ forever. That's how the martyrs face death. Read the martyrdoms. Read the saints who were martyred and take courage. I don't think you should fear it at all. I don't think any child should be taught to fear it or, you know, that whole psycho that's a whole you're creating a whole psychological problem that doesn't exist for the christian so we need to be brave and approach death as being overcome put aside we need to go to funerals look at the bodies in the coffins go to the graveyard look at them buried we need to be mindful of death we need to remember death just the opposite of what society does. There's nothing to be afraid of. That's the whole message of the gospel. Christ is risen, right? I've been advised to confess in a non-specific and summarized way because God will know what's on my heart. No, no, no. Yes, of course, that's nonsense. You're going to go and lay out what you did. And if necessary, you're not going to name names necessarily, unless it's a real extreme case. You're not going to name names, but you're going to say that there was this, there was a person. I did this with them. I, 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 I hate this person. I, you know, and they're going to, you're going to humiliate yourself, and it's going to be very specific to your life. And then you're going to walk away cleansed. Right? That is not the way to confess. God knows your heart. What is it? It's like Protestantism. God knows my heart. I can go to the I can go to the icon and say my confession. Nonsense. You got to go before the image of Christ, which is the priest. He's in the place and the type of Christ, just like the bishop. He serves the bishop, and he's in the same place in the divine liturgy that the bishop is, the type and place of Christ. And you stand before him as you do before Christ, and you 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 bear your body, your 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 soul. You become naked before God and you say, this is who I am. I'm this, this, and this. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, all of that garbage needs to be thrown out and exposed. And then it, it has no power once, when that happens. Other question, if your spiritual father is suspended, is his blessing to eat certain foods on fast days void? Um, no, not until you go to the next spiritual father. You need to find another spiritual father and ask him what you should do in that. All right, I think we're running out of time, folks. We're, we're really close to the three-hour mark. I don't think we can go much further. Uh, I'll try to get these two last questions in. Don't I don't think we can sub – don't submit any more questions at this point because I, I think we're out of time. I got two more questions over here at Crowdcast. And then we're going to close it up. I'm going to repeat for the like 15th time. Everything we talk about, everything St. Nicodemus talks about, the canons, all the canons mentioned, all that has to be applied by a priest or a bishop in real time in a parish. Read the book to acquire the mind. Read the book to get into the spirit. Read the book to see how far we are from the norm so we can be humbled. Yes, yes, yes. Read the 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 uh, amazing and humbling and contrition giving homily to come to our own self knowledge, not to despair, not to give up, but to come face to face with who we are and to see ourselves to be free of our of our passions. Yes, but do not start applying it indiscriminately. Do not expect everything exactly as it's said in the canon to be applied to you automatically. None of that is true unless it's applied by a spiritual father. Uh, and yes, if something didn't happen, they never gave you a penance, go to a spiritual father, go to an experienced elder, say, what do I do in this case? And they might say, well, it needs to be applied because this is how you're going to be healed. I don't know. All right, I don't know. You got to go and see that. Blessed Father, unfortunately, I am self-catechized. I was never told explicitly to go and find a spiritual father or father confessor, nor how that relationship is to be looked like. Really? That's amazing. I should take the counsel seriously and be obedient in simple terms. As I'm only discovering this now after two and a half years, I'm quite shocked, to be honest. Currently, the local priest I'm confessing, I don't see myself trusting him like I should, nor do I feel that we could ever have such a deep relationship. I feel uncomfortable with him. There's hardly any feedback. I'm also un received unorthodox counsel, like praying with my heterodox friends, the Our Father, 
There was no interest in the canons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not totally bad, but I don't feel heart warmth and helped. Uh, the ex Guitarian describes the qualities of a father confessor. Are these what I should look for in a priest? I think so, yeah. God willing, as close as you can get. Are these just the optimum and get what I get what I get? Well, certainly we're poor, so be be merciful. You might not get what St. Nicodemus was just describing. I don't know who lives up to that, but certainly try to approach it. That's the standard. Last one. These canons get confusing to me as a convert. Many terrible sins prior to converting. Married a non-Orthodox, obviously. So is all of my Protestant past not held against me when I first came into the church? Held against you? Why would it be held against you? You go to life confession. You go to you get your baptized. You start anew. I wouldn't be able to take communion until the end of my life if not. All of that before baptism is washed away in baptism. All of it. I wouldn't be able to take communion. Uh, sorry, I mean, where's the line? Before I was like a babe, maybe, and therefore it's not held against me. Now that I've heard it, these canons, medicine would be applied? Question mark. So, example, I was married and divorced prior to becoming the Orthodox Church, water baptized and chrismated. Water baptized, that's strange. It's baptized, that's what you mean. Did my marriage count as my first marriage? And if I was to marry again, I wouldn't, shouldn't, because nobody was following this. Get crowned? No, your marriage, we've already answered this. Marriage outside the Orthodox Church is not a mystery, not a sacrament. It is not counted as, as, a, as a mystery of the church. If there's somebody teaching that, I'd like to see on what basis. Like, where do they get that? What canons, what fathers are teaching us that there's such a thing as marriage outside of the church? I don't, I don't know this to be the case. I'm happy to be corrected if there's patristic evidence and canonical evidence. and you know, But if just somebody is saying, hey, no, I think we should consider it. It's not how we do it in the Orthodox Church. We don't just make stuff up. We follow the Holy Fathers. All right? All right, Lydia. God, God bless. Don't worry. Keep going. Next question. Last question. Father, as a Protestant, one told me, once told me, they are assured of heaven once saved. Coming from that mindset, what should we as Orthodox be? Uh, we've answered this, Tina, many times. We've talked about salvation what it means to be saved in the Orthodox Church is communion. This is an ongoing process, an eternal process. You enter into it. You can fall away from it if you're apostate, just like Judas did. I mean, the whole Protestant soteriology is nonsense. It's just nonsense. Once saved, always saved is just nonsense. I don't know where they get this stuff. It's a total legalistic, partial, heretical taking of parts of Scripture. It's not, it's not what's taught by the fathers of the saints. All right. Um, father, what do we do if we don't have a spiritual father, but only a father confessor? That he, he is de facto your spiritual father until you find someone who will say, I'm your spiritual father. I take you on. You go to confession to him. You receive his counsel. But that's not usually the same thing as a spiritual father, right? He himself might say, I'm not your spiritual father. I just hear your confession. So a spiritual father is somebody who takes him on your uh, you on his shoulders, Right? He guides you in many more things than just hearing your confession. You might go to him and say, what do I do about this case with my selling my house? You might even ask him. I don't know. Whatever you think. But it's a father figure. Somebody who guides you in many ways. Right? All right. I think that's it, folks. We're going to call it a night. It's been good. Hopefully this has been helpful. Hopefully this book, you know what I, I did not say tonight, which was terrible. And I've got to make this point because my coworkers are going to crucify me. This book, this week, is available from Uncle Mountain Press. And you, if you buy it, you get a free book. You, get, you can choose from four books for free. Patristic Theology, one of, one of four. Patristic Theology, Truth of Our Faith, Pope, The Church and the Pope by Robert Spencer, or Antichrist, Fulfillment of Globalization. Again, Buy Exima Logitarian this week through Uncle Mountain Press website and get one of four books for free. You put it in your shopping cart and it will be zero once you go to check out. One of four books, Truth of Our Faith, Patristic Theology by Father John Manides, Truth of Our Faith by Elder Cleopa, The Church and the Pope by Robert Spencer, or Antichrist Fulfillment of Globalization. 
Great books, phenomenal books. One and four, free when you buy Extreme Guitar and this week from Uncommon Press. Hopefully that has gotten across and you're still around, most of you, to hear it. I think you're going to, you know, why not take advantage? If you're going to buy the book, buy it this week. You get a free book out of it. It's a great offer. God bless you. Pray for us. And again, got to be applied in real time by a spiritual father. Enter into the mind, acquire the spirit, humble yourself before the standard of the fathers, but go and find a spiritual father and apply, get it applied by a physician of the soul and body, by a shepherd of the church. That's non-negotiable, right? It's not possible. We are, the church is the incarnation, the continuation incarnation. You've got to meet Christ in space and time, meaning in the person of Christ, meaning the, in the church, but in the person of the priest who is in the type and the place of Christ. That's how it works. There's no way around it. God bless you. God keep you. Pray for us. Hopefully this has been very beneficial. And we will see you tomorrow night for everybody on Patreon and Orthodox Ethos. Question and answer session five. We're going to talk about the persecution being unleashed across the Orthodox world against those who are confessing the faith against ecumenism and COVIDism. We may be entering a new period of COVIDism. We may be seeing churches being told they got to shut down again and mask in church and all this nonsense it looks like they're revving up so covidism is going to be back in the news our book by the way that's going to be on sale as well in a week or so get ready our book let no one fear death is still very relevant you want to read that prepare yourself for what's coming but there is a persecution it seems to me and i'm going to give a bunch of cases tomorrow night for all of you who are on patreon and orthodox ethos cases in greece cases in America, cases in other places where priests are being singled out. They're being persecuted either by the state of the church for confessing the faith. Um, you know, they're going after them. There's hit pieces coming out against them. There's little slanderous things being said about them to shut down their work, shut down their publications. Right here at Orthodox Ethos and Command Press, same thing happening. This is the worldly spirit has entered in among the church among some when they can't answer the theological and ecclesiastical case being made they go after you ad hominem they go after you and try to make up false accusations this is going on all around the orthodox world we're going to talk about it tomorrow night question and answer session orthodox ethos join us at patreon join us at the orthodox ethos to be a part of that discussion friday night i'm going to be a guest on exposing powerful lies it's a wet it's a uh, youtube channel uh very serious orthodox christian has that he's going to interview me at five o'clock on friday night specific time eight o'clock on, on east coast and you're going to want to go to exposing powerful lies uh podcast i guess on youtube we'll see you soon god bless thanks for joining us Oh,